morning. It is Wednesday, January 4th here in New York City. This is Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman with Brad Smith and Brian Sazi. And let's get to the top three things you need to know as the clock hits 9 a.m. Futures are inching higher this morning after a sloppy start to the year with Wall Street darlings Apple and Tesla adding to souring sentiment. We'll talk about what that means for the broader market and whether they're coming back today. Plus, showdown in Washington. Kevin McCarthy failed to gain the votes needed to become Speaker of the House with voting set to resume at noon today. We've got the latest on the D.C. drama. And a bumpy ride. Tesla shares closed at their lowest levels in two years yesterday after the automaker missed on deliveries for the third straight quarter. We're going to speak to one bearish tech investor about what might come next for the battered EV manufacturer. But we begin today with our top story. Apple's market cap sank below $2 trillion for the first time since June 2021, marking a notable fall from grace for the tech giant as inflation and weaker economic conditions stoke demand fears. Apple is the last major company to surrender its $2 trillion valuation after Microsoft and Saudi Aramco both slipped from the mark last year. And the stats are just, I would say, stunning outside of just the optics of this $2 trillion mark. We have Apple shares now down 15% in the past month alone. Company has not come out with any release. They have not won on earnings. They have not pulled a sales force and cut workers like we saw from Salesforce this morning. Yet there's a lot of concerns out there, mostly driven by fears about the China reopening on how Apple fared in that December quarter. Yeah, and what's interesting about Apple is it held up relatively well for most of last year. And indeed, if you look at the 2022 performance for Apple, it fell, but it didn't fall as much as uh, some of its large cap tech peers, right? What really changed is in the last month when it really started to accelerate to the downside and then outpaced on the downside the Nasdaq's fall, for example. The Nasdaq 100, which was down about 9% over the month of December, Apple was down 12% in the month of December. And it does have to do with some of these demand concerns and concerns about what's going on in China. The question is whether the demand will just be delayed mm -hmm. or eliminated, which is frequently the question with Apple, right? So is it just that it, some of its iPhone sales will be pushed out further? or that people just won't get the phones at all. Yeah, and on the front of that demand, it really just comes back to where Apple finds itself in this cycle. And for the next super cycle that can emerge, especially within that iPhone category, which is more than half of its overall revenue and net sales uh, at the end of the day across product categories, you saw weakness in iPad. Perhaps that's an area where they're gonna continue to have to account for some of that weakness year over year declines there. But one other part of the business that continues to hold up well and where investors might be trying to get ahead of any kind of pullback in some of those consumer discretionary dollars in platform is the services business. And that services business continues to exhibit growth. Didn't quite hit $80 billion run rate last year, but you're looking at a services business on a quarterly revenue basis that is bringing in more uh, than the equivalent of market caps of companies like Spotify and Snap and Take-Two Interactive, all of those areas where Apple, of course, does want to play in one facet or another. I mean, we are, are we at that point? Are we nearing that point where we can say Apple shares might be oversold? And Dan Ives, this guy's been on fire this morning, publishing notes on Salesforce, uh, Apple, and Tesla. But I like what he said on Apple. He said he looks, based on his channel checks, uh, that demand for the iPhone looks to be stable. Now, he is seeing some cuts in the supply chain for Macs, uh, other devices that Apple produces. But if that iPhone demand is stable, that is your, usually the, the driver of Apple stock. So is it just oversold here? It could be. I mean, the valuation is st it's still trading above its long-term average. I think it's trading at about 20 times forward yes. earnings. Um, but uh, one more thing you can look at is the expectations. The company is set to report its earnings towards the end of the month. And here are the first quarter revenue estimates wow. from analysts. And you can see the decline here that we have seen in, in the numbers. Yes, definitely. So that's something... Um, to keep in mind, I think that should be millions instead of thousands, but you get the general. Yeah, idea. positive. If you're trading Apple into earnings, of course, this is now what they would say a lower bar to beat. You know, yeah. Apple would come out here with a penny beat and maybe the stock would go up. Yeah, absolutely. Going to keep a close eye on shares of Mega Cap Tech, but especially AAPL. We're also keeping an eye on shares of TSLA, Tesla. New year, but no relief. The stock fell to its lowest level since August of 2020 after the company released its lackluster fourth quarter delivery figures. Yahoo Finance's senior auto correspondent, Pras Subramanian, here with the EV Roundup. All right, so Pras, what did we really take away from some of those numbers that Tesla dropped and what is this kind of set up for other automakers too? You know, we had this nice three-day little bounce in the stock after a horrible run in December, but mm -hmm. We lost that again, two-year two lows here after those lackluster delivery numbers, like you mentioned, you know, missing that delivery target by four, like 20,000 or so. But I think the big question here, Brad, is the demand concern. Are we seeing that come down? Mm -hmm. um, a number of analysts are asking that. Is Tesla going to actually cut their long-term 
50% growth rate around deliveries eventually? Are they gonna actually have to do that? Because you know, what we're seeing is that the, the Wall Street and the markets are, are valuing Tesla like a traditional automaker now. They're cutting down their sort of growth of the company. We're seeing the Ford P's come down here. Uh, it's still a very profitable business when you talk about Tesla itself and they can make more EVs than anyone on the planet, but the story is changing now, right? right? They're becoming, as, as we see the demand come down, we see their, the, the, the actual demand for the products come down, we're seeing them kind of valued as like what a GM might be, what a Ford might be, and they're catching up too. Uh, Praz, you know, our team made a good point in our morning meeting this morning that we're so, we've been so fixated on Tesla and the stock slide, and, and that is right on the mark. Well, if that's the case, who's the other winner here? Is it General Motors? Because you've been covering General Motors a lot. You recently reviewed that new EV Hummer. It seems like they have risen to the occasion, and they're about to drop a lot of new models on the market that maybe does take market share from a Tesla that's maybe uh, taken its eye off the ball because of Elon Musk. I think Mary Bear there and GM has sort of outlined their strategy. We're going to take our time to get into this market. 2023 is our big year. Get that battery platform set up. We drove the, Rick and I drove that Hummer and it's an incredible truck. And I think that's what we're going to see in the new Silverado and the Sierra EV trucks. Very impressive. And they might be able to be price competitive too. So I think they might be the one big uh, benefit here, ben benefactor as well as, well as Ford as well. Uh, but I think it's a little big year for Tesla. They have their big investment meeting on, on March. We're going to talk about what's next for them, new platform, Maybe we'll hear more about Cybertruck. So there's still some potential for them to kind of emerge from a, a really sour 2022 and maybe kind of get back some gains 2023. For what it's worth, Kathy Wood has also been adding to her position in the stock. Um, uh, among she, she kind of started to rebuild her position in the fall and then added more shares to it. I mean, you know, it, it, and I guess it just sort of reinforces the sentiment that there are these true believers still in Tesla, but that it's a very divisive company and stock for many people. Yeah, I mean, a lot of high conviction uh, owners of Tesla shares, heavily shorted, right? Came down a lot, but still a lot of heavily invested people that are really believe in the Elon story, and Kathy Wood is one of them. Um, I mean, her high conviction trade, she had to sell a stock before to, to rebalance her portfolio, not just mm -hmm. getting back in. So um, she's, she's in it for the long haul, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, I think you're right. It's one of these stories that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge or retail investor stock, and there's such a heavy focus on their, really, their, their bulls that are out there that are really believing the story. And the bears might be savaging Tesla, of course, but at least they're able to hit their, their production marks. We are not seeing that from Rivian. Another disappointing uh, number for them in terms of production. And this is going to be a big year for this company. Yeah, so we saw the Q4 number come out and full year, 24,337 for the, for, the, for the year produced. Uh, just shy of that 25,000 goal. I was a little surprised they actually came that close given the, the troubles that they've had. But you know, they ramped up in a second ship of the factory. Uh, they produced 10,000 vehicles in, in Q4, 8,000 delivered. So still a long way to go. But I think the big question, for, like I think we're asking size is that they got to make these vehicles that make, produce them in, a, in an affordable way, like not 100% negative net uh, gross margin. Price right? tags are huge. I mean, they're losing 100 grand per car, right, as of last quarter. So, wow. hmm. can they cut that? And, and, and you know, they, they pulled out the Mercedes van deal because they're trying to conserve cash. So, the big question is, can they actually become a profitable business, make these cars, and make enough of them that people actually people still want them? They also like, service man. all those Amazon orders too. What's that? They're supposed to make vans for Amazon. Yeah, I've seen a couple of them actually in Brooklyn, but they got to make uh, like at least 10,000 of those, I think. So there's a long way to go. Yeah, well, we saw the shares, little change there um, uh, on those numbers. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Press. Appreciate it. Turning to politics now and the feedback to what that means for markets. The House will come back into session at noon today after Kevin McCarthy, you see him there, his bid to capture the speakership failed in three rounds of voting. McCarthy's failure to round up a group of hardline conservatives could mark problems ahead for the new Congress. And Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman is here with us. The new Congress and the Republican Congress in particular is what we're talking about here because this is not a good look for them. Uh, he did just get a, a big supporter in his column. Isn't this fun? <laughs> <laughs> right. Donald Trump, former president, uh, this morning said, I want all Republicans to get behind Kevin McCarthy. He might, he will do a good job and maybe even a great job. So this is another fascinating wrinkle on, on top of the chaos within the Republican Party. So um, what's, what this means, so this is, a, first of all, it's a test of Trump's power. And uh, he is trying to persuade the most radical of the uh, con of the conservative uh, wing of the Republican Party to get behind Trump. These are Trump's biggest supporters. I mean, this is the Freedom Caucus who are holding out against Kevin McCarthy, and Trump is basically saying to the uh, to the most extreme magnates in the Republican Party, "Get behind this guy." So, will they get behind him or won't they? And if so, if they do, if they follow Trump's lead, 
um, then they are then they are sort of um, abandoning their their firebrand campaign here to get somebody who they think will be more combative, uh, and not they want somebody who's not just combative against Democrats. They want somebody who's more combative against like moderate Republicans in the Senate. Mm -hmm. So will Trump persuade these people? In which case, Trump uh, Trump gets a little bit of a bump uh, in terms of his political power, or will they uh, tell? Uh, Trump to go pound sand because they're doing their own thing, in which case Trump's political power continues to wane. I mean, Trump is clearly, uh, you know, a sell at this point. Um, so will he will there be a little bounce in the Trump uh, stock, if you will? Is she coverage on sell rating? On <laughs> I've, I've had a sell rating on Trump Long since, since uh, the end of 2020. So <laughs> uh, we're going to break out the technicals in a little bit. Um, but additionally here, if you're on the kind of other side of the aisle, then what is the calculus? What's the strategy that Democrats are trying to lean into as this is taking place with the GOP. Uh, you know, what's the old what's the old axiom in politics? When your opponent is self-destructing, just get out of the way and let it continue to happen, which is exactly what they're doing. So there has there has been this idea. So, you know, to, in order for somebody to be elected speaker, you need a simple majority of votes of those who are present in the House. So all the Democrats have been showing up and voting, and that's why their leader, Hakeem Jeffries, has actually been getting more votes than Kevin McCarthy. Uh, because he's getting literally every single Democratic vote and literally every Democrat is showing up. So there's been this idea that um, Democrats could help McCarthy by some of them just don't show up to vote. And so McCarthy still doesn't get the holdouts, but the quorum uh, shrinks in size. Um, but I, I can't imagine why Democrats would do that. They, uh, th th uh, that is one pathway for McCarthy to become speaker. Um, that seems unlikely. So it looks as if Democrats are just going to sit back and enjoy this. And, you know, I think politically, uh, the question is, what are, will this have lasting implications? Um, and if this is a preview of how the Republicans are going to run the House, then it will have positive implications for Democrats because uh, the Republicans are just in disarray and they don't, they can't even manage themselves. So you cannot make a great case to voters going into 2024. Trust us to manage the economy. Trust us to manage the southern border. Uh, trust us to manage health care when you can't even manage yourself. Rick, two questions in one, then who ultimately gets this speaker gig? And then what does this mean for markets? Because investors have been trained to think gridlock is good for markets. We're really throwing spaghetti at the wall here. I mean, usually this is this drama we see in Washington, a lot of it is man-made and it all leads to what is kind of a foregone conclusion. There is not a foregone conclusion here. So before the Trump endorsement, the analysis I was seeing said, uh, McCarthy looking very weak uh, and it's hard to see how he pulls this out, which means Steve Scalise, who is McCarthy's number two right now, could emerge, emerge as the guy who could get all the traditional votes and enough of the uh, MAGA votes to actually get elected speaker. Now, does the Trump endorsement of McCarthy change that? Um, if McCarthy falls away, will Trump then say, OK, fine, go, for, go with Scalise? Um, and if not Scalise, who? So I well, think Steve the, Scalise looks like the most likely at this point. But then there was also some talk about Fred Upton, who's a more moderate Republican, maybe even getting some Democratic votes. I, I, that, that, this is fun, uh, you know, sort of political theater. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I do not see any Republican getting any Democratic votes because I, why would the Democrats help them resolve this? I mean, if, if this, I mean, I think the longest this has ever gone in the history of, of Congress is it once went all the way into March before they, before there was a speaker. Um, and if, I think if Democrats could, could let that happen, they would absolutely just let that happen because the, uh, the more ridiculous the Republicans look, the better it is for Democrats. All right, breaking down all of the political calculus and how the markets may move on some of this as well. Yahoo Finance is on. Thanks, Rick guys. Newman, appreciate it. And everyone, coming up, our next guest is warning of possible setbacks ahead for oil. We're going to discuss that next.
Welcome back. Oil is sitting at around 75 to kick off 2023 as demand concerns continue to weigh on investors. But our next guest is expecting a long road ahead to reaching the next equilibrium point for crude. Vanda Insights founder and CEO Vandana Hari joins us now. Great to have you here with us this morning. At what point and what timeline are you looking at and, and does your calculus kind of show that we will reach that equilibrium? Uh, morning, Brad, and thanks for having me. It's uh, a major recalibration uh, in process as we step into 2023. Uh, the um, center stage for the oil markets is, of course, a global economy. And um, as we know, and I'm sure you've been discussing uh, all day long in, in your shows as well, it, huge question marks on um, what, where do we have a recession, the length, the timing, the depth of the recession and so on. But all in when, um, you know, sitting uh, from the perspective of the oil market, basically uh, the mood is, is quite dark right now uh, in terms of, um, you know, economic headwinds. And of course that relates directly to uh, oil demand. The one bright spark, um, you know, going into the end of last year was, of course, uh, China uh, doing an abrupt U-turn from its zero COVID policy and starting to reopen. Uh, that is now uh, still a bright spark, of course, because that's going to change the calculus quite a bit on, on global oil demand, but a distant one. So I think that is also playing uh, into um, the bearish pressure that we're seeing in oil right now, basically that China um, has run into quite a, a bit of difficulties uh, coming, uh, overcoming, it's um, basically reopening and, uh, you know, th that it's going to probably get much worse uh, in China in terms of uh, mobility and economic activity before it starts getting better. So given that we are seeing slowing globally and, and that the China reopening, even though it's happening, is a bit rocky, is there anything that's going to provide a floor under oil prices right now? And if so, where do you see that floor? Yes. So, Julie, you know, temporarily, um, and this happened throughout the last quarter of last year as well, we had what I call bouts of Fed pivot optimism. And, um, you know, that's been a constant, I believe, that will remain with us. Of course, right now it seems to have taken a back seat, but um, basically the market betting against uh, the Fed continuing to tighten. And I see that, uh, you know, quite a few consensus views still out there are that the Fed will um, will pause sometime in, in Q2 and, and actually start to cut rates in the second half of uh, this year. Now, whenever that has happened uh, in the past few months, we, we've seen um, crude get quite a lift as well. So on a, on a sort of, but that tends to be short lived. Uh, but, you know, th that's uh, that's a floor. If you ask me, you know, what might uh, might support uh, the other, I guess, uh, obvious floor is, uh, as I said, Chinese um, demand coming back, Chinese um, reopening, uh, looking more stable and solid. But again, that's probably not happening until at least the second quarter of this year. Um, the final floor will obviously be uh, OPEC plus uh, moving to cut production even more, but I don't believe they will uh, do anything uh, soon. I think they, they, they'll remain in a wait and watch mode. Uh, I think uh, prices are still well above their pain threshold. And Vandana, I'm, I'm looking at uh, natural gas down more than 40 percent since December 15th. What has driven that move and, and do you see more declines there? Yeah, so uh, Brian, Europe has had a great relief actually um, in guess it through the autumn and months and stepping into the winter season. First of all, I think they did phenomenally well actually in uh, stocking up gas for um, for the winter months. So they had going into into the winter season, they had very good storage levels of gas. Uh, they, you know, they, throughout uh, 2022, they've been buying a, a lot of LNG to supplement. Uh, to plug the gap uh, in supplies from from Russia, and then they've had a mild start to winter and a mild winter so far. So, um, and plus, uh, uh, consumption has uh, been cut back quite a bit. You 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 recall uh, there was uh, an agreement amongst the EU members to voluntarily reduce their consumption by fifteen percent, and and they've been generally quite successful at that. So, um, as far as gas uh, and Europe goes, uh, you know, and that was the main pain point in in terms of gas markets uh, globally. Uh, there's there's quite a bit of, bit of relief right now, but you know, 
Um, we don't know what the summer months might bring. Uh, even though gas demand goes down, that's when Europe has to start stocking again for winter. So, um, you know, it all depends on uh, whether Russia um, yanks the reins again on gas supplies to Europe and, and things could get worse again. Despite the pullback in, in crude oil prices, uh, some big names in this space, Chevron, Exxon, are, are expected to still post billions and billions of dollars in profits this year. How do you think they will mm -hmm. distribute those profits to shareholders? Yeah, so uh, last year was uh, obviously a bumper year for oil and gas producers, thanks to oil, high oil and gas prices. This year, of course, they may not perform that well. Uh, I think what uh, the likes of ExxonMobil and Chevron will do as a result is probably they'll get even more cautious in terms of their spending, make sure they get good returns on whatever they're, they're spending. Um, I think the mantra for them remains uh, to continue rewarding shareholders. So we've seen, um, you know, announcements of share buybacks, those will continue, uh, high dividends, those will continue. And these two companies in, uh, in, in the U.S. are um, continuing to focus on oil and gas. Uh, they whatever uh, capital expenditure they have planned is mostly going into oil and gas, which is quite a contrast to their peers uh, across the Atlantic. And um, basically, they they are uh, they are consolidating. They have their this was a trend for the past several years. They have been shrinking their global footprint. They'll concentrate on the Americas. Basically, remain in the discovered and uh, developed basins and uh, try to maximize their profits. Wandana Harry, Vanda Insights founder and CEO. Always good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Coming up, Salesforce just revealed a major cost-cutting plan, setting a slowdown in demand. We have the analysis next. Still a few minutes away from the opening bell on Wall Street, so let's dive into some red-hot trending tickers. Not just hot, red-hot trending tickers. Shares of Microsoft are in focus following a downgrade from the folks over at UBS as they now have a neutral rating on the software company. UBS also slashed its price target on Microsoft from $300 down to $250. 
This all coming on concern over growth rates from Microsoft's Azure cloud computing business. And I wouldn't say this is a bold call by any stretch of the imagination. We've been reporting the past three quarters from Microsoft that growth rate uh, in cloud services for that Azure service has slowed down. And in light of uh, the Salesforce workforce reductions, we'll, which we'll talk about in a second, this call, at least it makes sense to me. Yeah, and on the cloud side of the business, I think for the install base, or at least the client base that Microsoft has and what UBS is pointing out within this, they're talking about the Office 365 business being vulnerable um, in terms of the installed base that Microsoft does have. And if you do see this, um, this element of compression in the seat count, so seat count compression among some of those core clients as headcount growth and, and actually headcount reduction has been core to some of the cost restructurings at companies who are clients of Microsoft right now too. Um, and that hits on the number of licenses that those clients would need in that Office 365 element. I know the stock is being affected by this call this morning, but what I'm interested in regarding Microsoft has nothing to do with this downgrade. And it's a reporting that was first reported by the information mm -hmm. that Microsoft is testing out ChatGPT on its Bing search engine to potentially help power that search engine. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, ChatGPT is this AI powered I don't know, uh, response service, I guess, I don't know what you would call it, that is uh, owned by OpenAI, which was funded by a billion dollar investment from Microsoft, so they have a relationship with that. Um, and effectively, you put in prompts for all kinds of things. If you look across the internet, you have all kinds of fun things that people have, have asked um, this AI robot. Um, and it comes back with answers that make sense. Some of them are not accurate, but they make sense. And so the idea, I think, is that Bing would, instead of Google giving you the search results, ChatGPT would give you like a full paragraph, if you will, of something that you asked it. Bing, as we know, <laughs> doesn't do very well versus Google, has a very much yeah. smaller market share. Could this change it down the road? Who knows, but it's an intriguing possibility our, to me. Our AI uh, text correspondent, Mike, pointing out this is an AI text Generator. I guess ah, you learn okay. something new every day, there right? There you go. That's what you would call it. AI text, <laughs> text generator. generator. Okay. Well, yeah, people have been testing writing out term papers with chat GPT. So, Recipes, uh, all re kinds yeah. of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, tech for good or tech for bad, especially if they're going to embed this in Bing. I mean, I put that out to our audience watching this. I'm curious on what, what they think. Hit us with some tweets because this seems like scary technology at the very least. And to qualify for part of the conversation on Twitter, you have to have used Bing within the last three months for sure. Um, and oh, wow. I'm just joking. Wow, here, burn. But, That's yeah. tough. I mean, look, well, it, we have, if they're, if Bing's bringing less than $10 billion in revenue. You have to think Google is going to do it, and then all these search engines are doing it, and then it changes the complete world. Right, but if they have the proprietary relationship with ChatGPT, then perhaps Bing would have the edge in this. Mm -hmm. And for good or for, I, I don't know, I'm not convinced it's evil. Ooh, I don't know, that it really? would be a terrible thing. Ooh, I didn't expect that. I've seen that. some yeah. interesting use cases for it. Um, writing code. You're always throwing me curveballs, Julia. Writing code, I saw somebody who wrote it for a scavenger hunt for their kids Ooh, that they didn't have time good. to put together, so they held the prompts for the scavenger hunt they weren't all great, but some of them were helpful at least. You always keep it interesting, Julie. I don't know. I, I like. I appreciate I it. I like to surprise you. You, you could use it to write some that stories. That was an upside surprise. That's like when yeah. Apple. Well, that's that's the scary part, right? <laughs> is using it to write some stories. There you see uh, the folks from today. I think they're celebrating what five years on the helm of that show. So ringing the opening bell here this morning as we are looking for a higher open potentially this morning. Of course. We had a higher open yesterday, yeah. and then it melted away by day's end. So it seems like the Santa Claus rally is definitely not happening. Today would be the last day. If somehow mm. stocks pulled out a massive rally today, the Santa Claus rally would be intact. But otherwise, it looks like it's a lost cause. Well, something to keep in mind, and this is something that our very own Miles Allen writes a lot about. Stocks usually go up, so maybe they'll go up. Over the long term. Over the long term. As he wrote in a morning brief yes. earlier this week, the 20 year time, very good morning, time horizon is the, is the ideal time horizon. Right now, stocks are hanging on to gains mm -hmm. as we begin the session. And Brad, what are you seeing over there at the Interactive? Yeah, taking a look at some green on the screen here to kick things off. Let's populate this chart for you. The Dow Jones Industrial Average out of the gate, higher by about three-tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ Composite, you're seeing that up by about six-tenths of a percent. So some fractional gains across the board for all the major averages as the S&P 500 rounds that out with gains of about half a percent right now. Let's take a look at some of the sector activity early into 
today's session. As we kick things off, we've got a look at the 11 S&P 500 sectors, largely leaning in the positive territory. Uh, XLE, X, or energy, excuse me, bringing up the caboose though right now. It's down by about 1.5%. However, another interesting and kind of strong day for communication services. Earlier this week when we were tracking that sector, it was one of the uh, outperformers as well. And so you're seeing that lead the pack right now. It's up by about 1.4%. Also financials catching a bit here today. That's up by about 1.1%. We were talking about some mega cap tech companies a little bit earlier on in the show. Take a look at Apple here early in trade. That's up by about 1.1%. Amazon, that's lower though, by about two tenths of a percent. Microsoft, we were just discussing them on a downgrade. That's down by about 3.6%. And then Alphabet, Google, Alpha Google, whatever you call them, call them up here on the day by about four tenths of a percent. Alpha Google, I like that. All right, let's take a look at Salesforce as well. Those shares are up almost 4% as a major job cuts keep on coming for the tech industry. The software company announcing a plan to cut about 10% of its staff in a restructuring plan that Salesforce says is intended to reduce operating costs, improve margins, and continue advancing the company's ongoing commitment to profitable growth. Um, it is going to cost the company in the, in the short term as uh, these kinds of reductions usually do. $1.4 billion to $2.1 billion, and as much as a billion will come in the fourth quarter of fiscal 2023. So, you know, another company doing this. Yeah, this is, um, I would say, new territory for me. I've covered Salesforce seven or eight years now. I've never seen a workforce reduction uh, like this by them, if, if any at all. I've only known Salesforce to be growth at all costs, but now this is finally, I think, starting to catch up to this company. I, I would say it was a little bit telegraphed. You know, we talked to Mark Benioff at Dreamforce in September, telling us that he was serious about the profit margins. They have a 25% operating profit margin goal by 2025. He seemed very serious about hitting that goal. This is a step, I think, in helping them achieve this against the backdrop of what he acknowledges that, one, they hired too many people for a demand backdrop that seems to be slowing down now. And uh, of course, this comes from, uh, you know, a, this is a Salesforce angle, but also a broader tech issue here, yeah. Brad, as well. When you have a Salesforce saying demand is, is slowing, we're now in the first quarter uh, of 2023. And if Salesforce is seeing this with its best in class technology, best believe a lot of other companies are seeing it as well, whether it's Microsoft, we just mentioned that downgrade right. this morning with Azure, best believe others are seeing it as well. Yeah, one of the common denominators between Microsoft Microsoft and the Salesforce story is that client seat compression that I was talking about. But then you also think about the over hiring that Salesforce is kind of acknowledging that they did here. Pre pandemic, or at least early in the pandemic, April of 2020, they had about 51,000 full time equivalent employees. And so now you look at that growth over this most recent period that they reported for, that figure coming in at 79,824. And so serious growth there. And, and you, you kind of wonder. Has it kept pace or has that outpaced what the revenue growth has been? Because they've continued to grow out that revenue base, $7.84 billion there. And so you've had periods in the past where Salesforce, even in spite of some of their record reports for revenue in the past, had still made significant headcount cuts. But it's just a, a matter of what parts of the business they're doing some of the trimming at, too. And important to note, decisions like this do not happen overnight. These are, especially a company the size of Salesforce, this is probably close to a year in the making. And I think you're getting a better sense now why there has been a lot of uh, executive departures at Salesforce over the past three months. Slack founder, Stuart Butterfield, you had Brett Taylor, co-CEO uh, uh, at Salesforce, he, him leaving as well. These are founders, founder-led uh, executives that only know growth. They want to be involved with growth stories, not bringing the ax to an entire workforce. Well, I don't know where they're going to find growth stories right now, but Mark Benioff uh, wrote a letter to employees and he takes responsibility for this. He said, as our revenue accelerated through the pandemic, we hired too many people leading into this economic downturn we're now facing, and I take responsibility for that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll continue to track shares of CRM and see what that strategy and the reduction looks like going forward from here. We're also tracking shares of Target and Etsy. Both of those are moving off of rating changes this morning. First, let's take a look at TGT. This follows a downgrade from overweight to equal weight by Wells Fargo as the bank is also slashing its price target on the retail giant from $170 down to $142 here. Um, and so there you're taking a look at what's kind of changed there in the mix. But uh, again, the consumer discretionary environment far different, I think, for the different categories that Target has tried to move through some of their inventory, especially where consumers have pushed back 
because they probably don't need another laptop or they don't need one of the consumer electronics devices where they face some of those issues. It's also in the apparel category. These other discretionary categories that target, that's going to be one to watch uh, as they continue to give us some more insights into how they're performing. Right. I, I just put my serious posture on and my face on because this is a serious call on Target by Ed Kelly over at Wells Fargo saying Target's outlook has deteriorated meaningfully and we no longer see it as an attractive investment into an uncertain 2023. That is a big call. Uh, you don't make calls like that lightly, having been in that seat with, with Ed. You know, that is a type of call that you risk just damaging your, rela damaging your relationship with the company. But him, uh, I guess he has seen enough uh, in those November, December channel checks at retail. And I've seen it too. A lot of inventory building up, notably in toys, that he sees potentially another earnings miss from Target when they report in the middle of February. That would be the third straight earnings miss from a Target in addition to maybe he sees another warning for the balance of this year. Yeah, on the other side of the uh, retail coin this morning, we have an upgrade for Etsy over at Needham going to buy from hold with a new price target of $160 a share there uh, from that analyst, Anna Andreeva, um, and basically saying that the company has been underperforming, but its model is proving to be sticky in keeping pandemic gains. So that's uh, part of what the thesis is here is that, you know, remember we had that whole discussion about how Etsy had a mask boom, right? Yeah. Everybody was selling masks on Etsy. And the concern was, the pandemic's over, people aren't buying, well, it's not over, but people are not buying masks in the same quantity that they were. Oh, that's going to be a problem for Etsy. And I think her argument is that people actually hung around and kept buying stuff. I mean, they're going to have to do something on the front to really kind of prop up the seller environment on Etsy even more so. They've been investing heavily into that, um, trying to enhance the customer experience across the marketplace, trying to retain, grow out the buyer base as well. Um, and it's kind of all part of this right to win strategy that they've rolled out. But I mean, you look at the most recent quarter, you did see GMS, the gross merchandise sales actually down 3.3% year over year. So it's gonna come against some tough comps as well. Um, and not just the next quarter that they report for, but perhaps next year as we start to, or this year rather, as we start to get into some of the comparisons against when they did see that pandemic boom, perhaps it'll be a little bit more favorable. And very important point, uh, Anna mentions in here that Etsy is exiting the pandemic in a stronger position, arguably than when it went into the pandemic. And compare that to what we saw with these other pandemic plays like a Peloton. They are an absolute disaster right now. And I think that's a nice nod to Josh Silverman, the CEO of Etsy, longtime CEO. He has run a very just he's done a, a very good job throughout the pandemic. He, you don't see him or you haven't seen him make a lot of mistakes operationally over the past three years. Yeah, although there was some buyer pushback at some fee yes. increases. That was something that uh, got some attention from the company. All right, GE Healthcare. It is officially uh, trading on its own today after its effective spinoff from General Electric. GE Healthcare, GEHC is the new ticker here. The shares are up about six tenths of 1%, maker of medical equipment. And we will be speaking with the CEO of that newly spun off company a little bit later in the show. Coming up, Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickby is gonna break down the latest market action as stocks edge higher ahead of Fed minutes.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. The major averages are in positive territory to begin the day. Dow, S&P 500, and the NASDAQ all seeing green on the screen for more. Let's get to Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery over at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Jared. That's right. This is the second trading day of the year. And guess what? That means it is the end of the Santa Claus rally as of the close of business. Why do I keep mentioning this? Is it the lack of news? Is it because it's interesting? I think so. Uh, but also it portends what we might see uh, in the rest of January and the new year. Here's the Dow over the last seven days, up about 87 basis points, not even 1%. Very choppy action. Uh, if we took a downturn today off of those FOMC minutes, uh, could easily give all that back and end up with nothing. S&P 500 here also very choppy, up a little bit less than the Dow. NASDAQ actually negative, but what I want to show you is the Russell 2000. That is up over 1.4% over these seven days. And now I'm going to go to our heat map and show you what's happened over this time period. First, this is intraday. This is what's happening today. Only inner energy in the red, and maybe we'll get back to that in a second. But I want to show you what's happening with uh, the mega caps. Now, over the last seven days, Apple's down 4%, Microsoft a little bit less, Tesla down almost 11, NVIDIA 4%. You take these guys out, we would have a much stronger rally underhand, and I think that's why the Russell 2000 is outperforming. Also, the S&P 500 equal weight, where you don't weight things, uh, towards mega, weight things towards their market cap weight. That's also showing a little bit more strength. So the, the mega caps are definitely sick here, but we're going to have to see where we go. Now, here is, the, uh, here is our leader index over the last seven days. Only solar energy in dark red there. K-Web, Chinese stocks, really uh, flying high. They're up 9% over that time period. They're also the leader today. So let's check a look at the Chinese stock. We got Alibaba up 6%. Uh, looks like uh, some other, Neo up 6%. And Baidu also up a very similar amount. So really interesting to see all this play out. But uh, looking for more indications from January today and also those FOMC minutes to see if we can continue any little bit of strength. Jared Blickery, thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right, Santa Claus might officially be skipping Wall Street this year. The S&P 500 has traded higher by 78% during the Santa rally period, leading to an average gain of 1.3%. If the index skips the Santa rally this year, it would be the first time that happened since 2015. Coming up, will the Federal Reserve cut rates at some point this year? We'll discuss next.
Well, there's not necessarily much investors are agreeing on this year, but a lot of people are looking to the fixed income market as having a comeback in 2023. PIMCO Managing Director and Portfolio Manager Sonali Peer joins us now to discuss. Sonali, this has been one of the refrains that we have been hearing from investors. Why are people feeling so good about the bond market for this year. Yeah, absolutely. You know, after a tough 2022, it really has changed the landscape where yields are today. Of course, on the back of the, the Fed hiking rates. And, you know, today, if you look at the yields, even on 10-year treasuries, for example, there's positive yields that, you know, there wasn't long ago where we were talking about the stock of negative yielding assets. Mm -hmm. Today, not only have yields improved dramatically, but there's also providing a fair amount of income. So despite potential volatility in 2022, there's a lot of room now, uh, 2023, a lot of room now for income producing assets. And as you look out the curve, even out to credit markets, we can pick up even additional yield. And you believe that the bulk of the Fed rate increases is behind us. And I mean, largely, we would all hope that it certainly is given the kind of extent that they did raise last year. But what would that volatility that you were mentioning, what would that really hinge on in terms of their tenor and any type of rate increases that they continue to move forward with? Yeah, so from a Fed perspective, we do think the bulk of the move is behind us and, and you know, that, but yet volatility is likely to stay. And part of that has to do with the recession probability. You know, our base case is that we would likely see a um, mild recession, but one that's longer and shallower than, say, what we saw in the V-shaped uh, recession and recovery in 2020. Mm. Um, as a result, there's still a lot of volatility potential from an employment perspective as well as from a growth perspective. In a recession, what areas of the corporate bond market do you think would get hit this year? Yeah, you know, where we're most concerned, even though... You know, if you look at the public credit markets, there has been a fair amount of improvement on the back of, you know, the 2020 peak pandemic experience being rather recent. Many companies have raised a lot of debt, go, you know, in the back half of 2020 and in 2021 to help weather that storm. But where we're most concerned really has to do with areas where there's low multiples on those businesses, low margins, high cyclicality, where you know, it's very difficult to weather a storm like a recession. Um, when you have those types of things you know, against you, as well as still inflation. Sounds like retail. Impact. Retail is a big Retail would be one, autos, mm -hmm. wire lines, you know, some areas where you're just continuing to see declines, even some, some slow, some faster, but due to a shift in investor uh, demand, as well as disruption from the supply chain. So it sounds like even though you want to get your yield right now, you don't want to take on too much risk in order to get that yield. Is that fair to say? I think that's absolutely right. You know, where we're looking at opportunities really is because that fixed income has really repriced. Um, you know, but knowing that there's potential volatility ahead, it's really doing it for a long-term hold or for, you know, kind of scaling in at these higher yields for that income producing aspect of fixed income, as well as the fact that it will be less volatile typically in a recession than equity. So, you know, you're getting some cash flow along the way and then you're subduing some of that volatility relative to equity markets in a recession. So looking at investment grade, high quality parts of high yield, um, rather than say distress just yet. Mm -hmm. For investors that are just looking to find confidence coming out of 2022 and, and moving on into 2023 here, in their portfolio, where could they position or at least find one of those sources of confidence in the markets? Yeah, you know, I think areas that, that I, I, we believe that, you know, if you, even if you look at it from a long-term history of percentile of spreads and you look at, you know, the low probability of default. So, for example, you know, a sweet spot may be those triple Bs within investment grade, for example, where, you know, dollar prices have come down a lot as a, as a result of the interest rates rising as well as credit spreads having widened. But again, you know, we're, we're looking at this as an opportunity in more of the defensive sectors, a longer term hold um, where, you know, there, we do still expect that volatility in at least the first half of 2023, if not throughout. Stanley, thanks so much. It's a really interesting time. People are not used to seeing yields like this. So some definite opportunities out there. Stanley Pierre of PIMCO, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, hard seltzer popularity is fizzing out. sazi has got his take next.
Hard seltzer is going through hard times, with sales declining over 5% in the last year. Beer companies are turning their attention to a new fad. Brian Sazi has the details in today's take. When's the last time you had a hard seltzer? Sorry. Actually, on New Year's Eve, I pounded a really? couple of uh, high noons. Did wow. a threw a three back with a couple of shots, Julie. That's how we get down on New Year's Eve for full fair and disclosure. And then you got down literally. Yes, we did. <laughs> after a whole, after <laughs> drinking all You screwed up my take here, guys. Wow. Forget you, I forgot. Forget you guys. Sorry. Right, let, me, let me run through the numbers here. <laughs> Good note from my uh, buddies over at Evercore ISI doing a uh, hard seltzer deep dive. And there I am. I can't see. I might be holding a... A truly, ugh, I don't like truly, but uh, I am a high noon guy. Hard seltzer sales down 10.4% over the past four weeks. Uh, of course, Evercore ISI tracking the latest Nielsen uh, scanner data, which uh, of course has been compiling this data for years. Ready to drink sales uh, up 33.6%. Essentially, that is more like a twisted tea or a high noon or Mike's hard lemonade. But if you drill down to this hard seltzer weakness, and it looks like continued bad news for Boston Beer and its Truly brand. Uh, you have Truly uh, ha uh, core sales down 16.4% uh, in the past four weeks. And more, uh, more of a red flag, uh, sales of their newest offerings, which uh, they're viewing as uh, more premium vodka with real flavors as they try to go after the dominance that is High Noon. Sales of those products down 22.3% over the past four weeks. Uh, not a good look for Boston Beer, which of course last year struggled with buying too much inventory of truly hard seltzer as that market uh, slowed with new entrants into the market. So you're looking at potentially uh, more bad news from Boston Beer and truly when they report their fourth quarter uh, numbers in a couple weeks. But uh, you know, in the ready to drink numbers, it really a high noon. Uh, that brand has really come on uh, in, uh, on fire, owned by I think E&G e &G Gallo Winery Company, uh, up 87% uh, in terms of sales over the past four weeks. Cutwater, another uh, hard seltzer pitching something of a little bit better flavor profile relative to a truly sales of that up uh, almost 36% in the past four weeks. So all in all, uh, there have been bright spots in here, but again, that truly is a major red flag uh, for anyone investing uh, in the likes of a Boston beer. Also comes at a time we're starting to see a lot of negative comments come into the beer space. You had Boston Beer, I believe, downgraded today by Jefferies. Yesterday, some negative comments uh, by the team over at Wells Fargo because beer sales has been weakening. Uh, overall, my take is this uh, for my hard seltzer stuff, self and my, my high noon self. This will be the year of canned cocktails. Yes, indeed. We're still awaiting, I think, a broader rollout of that new Coca-Cola and Jack Daniels in a can. That is uh, launched in Mexico, I believe, uh, in the latter portion of last year. That rollout will continue. Canned wine sales are on fire here. It all makes sense to me. I can't wait to try it all. All in a can, all in somebody's Yeti as well. Yes. Perhaps in, in the cooler. It allows it to stay colder for a It just makes sense. It all works. It does. It just all works. I'm, I'm a fan of the can. I know, Julie. You're not a fan. I know. They have very good ones on the Delta. I'm just flight, not a big so. drinker generally, mm. so this stuff just doesn't. doesn't do it. Heine is pretty good, though. I they have like real flavors. It's like it's real juice. Yeah. It just hits you where, where it needs to hit you. Well, you got the uh, the Jack and Coke one. That partnership also rolled out, what, last year? Yeah, I, I was surprised, though. One quick last stat. Twisted Tea sales up 28.4% uh, over the past four weeks. I remember sucking down Twisted Tea when I was in high school hanging out by the pool. I'm surprised to see this brand still doing so well. That That's a big gain for a brand that's been around. Probably, what, over 15 years? Yeah, just living true to the name, still getting people twisted. Guys, coming up. You were in up. high school 13, 15 years ago? I'm on math Sorry. a little off. What Sorry. I'm trying to say. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I may have had a couple of drinks before I was 21, Julie. Thank you so much, all right? Thanks for outing me. I tried to let you slide. Guys, coming up, we're heading to Las Vegas where they do a lot of drinking and where we're going to find <laughs> Dan Howley, who has all you need to know from the Consumer Electronics Show. Plus, we'll get a pulse on the labor market with breaking economic data. That all happening in just two minutes.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm Brian Sazi alongside Julie Hyman and Brad Smith. We're seeing some tepid action in the markets ahead of the all-important jobs report on Friday, which will, of course, have implications on Fed policy. Right now, we're seeing Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ composite all in the green. But, Julie, I know you are tracking some breaking news, speaking of jobs, on uh, the jolt front. Yes, on the jolt front, job openings in the month of November at about 10.46 million, let's call it. Um, that is actually an increase. Oh, no, excuse me. It's a decrease from the revised number, a decrease from 10.5 million, um, and it's also higher than estimated. So there, in other words, there are more job openings than had been estimated by a pretty wide margin here. Um, and I know we're looking through the report, but I just want to mention the ISM numbers as well. We got the Institute for Supply Management's Manufacturing Index coming in at 48.4 for the month of December. So this is very fresh data, and that's pretty much in line with the 48.5 that was estimated. It's also a tick down from the prior month. Prices paid also ticking down, though. That's a little bit of good news here. 39.4 in that manufacturing report, which is down from 43 the prior month, and it's also much lower than the about 43 that was estimated by economists. Yeah, I would say this is almost peak goodness potentially in the JOLTS report. Of course, they are measuring uh, numbers for November. You see results or you see news like we've seen from Salesforce today. What, Brad? That's about 8,000 people that are about to lose their jobs at the company, joining many other tech companies. I can't see these JOLTS numbers getting any better from here. Yeah, and across some of the categories within or the sectors within this JOLTS report, particularly that stick out, job openings. And again, this is at the last business day of November. But those openings actually increased in professional and business services by about 212,000 uh, during the month. And then in non-durable goods manufacturing by about 39,000 there, but decreased in finance and insurance by about 75,000. And then federal government rolls by about 44,000 there. And so that kind of gives you some type of insight into the movement that we've seen sector by sector. But again, when you hear about the headlines from a sales force, from some of the other major tech companies that had already previously announced theirs, and in the professional and business services category, how that might continue to show up even in future days. Well, Goldman Sachs just this week uh, with layoffs. To be clear, yeah. the Fed does not want to see a JOLTS report like this, right? Mm -hmm. They want to see some tightening in the labor market which is not really evidenced in this because they want evidence that their efforts to cool inflation by cooling the economy are working. Now, there is evidence maybe on the, that manufacturing report, uh, maybe that's a little bit more positive when it comes to the read through for the Fed, if we are seeing a little bit of a contraction there. And in fact, it is 30, um, after 30 straight months of expansion, now we're seeing that manufacturing report the lowest since uh, May of 2020. And again, that price is paid component going down. So a little bit of a good news, bad news in these two reports. Again, purely from a read through for the Fed perspective. Um, and it looks like we are seeing stocks come off a little bit from the highs of the session um, as we do get these two reports. Again, the other thing is the JOLTS report is more of a dated report, right? It's from November. Mm -hmm. Manufacturing is from December. So um, take that into account when you look at these numbers as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the major things that we're tracking this year as well, especially at this time of year, one of the year's biggest tech conferences set to officially kick off tomorrow, setting the stage for breakthrough technologies and global innovators. Here for more on what to expect, we've got Yahoo Finance's tech editor, Dan Halley, the DH of tech out there in Las Vegas. Dan, set the scene for us. That's right, Brad. We're here at what is essentially the most influential electronics show of the year. This is CES 2023. We're out in front of one of the main halls here, and we're already seeing some big announcements. Just to give you an idea of the breadth of the types of technology, you'll see here we had Intel uh, yesterday and NVIDIA announcing some really impressive new products. Intel out with what they say is the world's most powerful mobile processor. Uh, that's part of their 13th generation HX line of chips. Uh, uh, basically, they're taking a huge swipe at AMD there, their big rival in the ch uh, chip space, as well as Apple, which left them by the wayside to build their own chips and puts them into their uh, MacBook Pro and MacBook line. Uh, NVIDIA, meanwhile, they announced some new mobile processors for graphics. So we're talking about for gamers, for uh, designers, uh, those are their RTX 40 series of chips. Uh, it runs from the RTX 4050 to the RTX 4090, but they also announced some new automotive 
automotive news, they're going to be working with Foxconn to help that company build its own electric and autonomous cars using NVIDIA's Drive Hyperion platform. Uh, it, it's part of their, their strategy to get the automotive division really trying to pump forward. Uh, right now, uh, as of Q3, it made $251 million in revenue. That's out of about $5.9 billion in overall revenue. So not really a huge part of the company as far as overall revenue, but they're growing that steadily. And then just to, to show how far uh, afield these kind of different technologies go, we also had uh, Indy here, uh, the Indy race car uh, teams, showing off what they're doing as far as autonomous Indy cars go. Now, uh, the data there is being collected. They're going to have teams of uh, students from nine different universities around the world participating in races this week using these autonomous Indy cars uh, going up to speeds of 200 miles per hour around the Las Vegas Speedway. And then on Saturday, they're going to have a final race to see which team has done the best. I was talking to some representatives from the teams uh, yesterday. They were basically saying, look, uh, we have teams from Italy. We have teams from uh, Alabama. They're all going about this their own way. Some want to go faster. Some want to be more precise. But all of this data would eventually be used to help autonomous cars on the road. The idea is to say, look, at 200 miles per hour, things are going to handle different. Let's figure out how all of these cars will work in all these different scenarios, uh, and it'll eventually filter down into us uh, in the long term. So a huge, huge breadth of different types of technologies here, and that's barely scratching the surface. Dan, while we have you, and I'm glad that you brought up the number of kind of vehicle or car plays that continue to show out at CES, because it's, it's kind of become this quasi car show, if you will, with some concepts that, that come forward. Who are some of the brands? Is Tesla, Mercedes, do they still take up space at a CES? Yeah, Tesla, no, but BMW has the, they built up their own pavilion in the parking lot. I mean, it's a massive building. Uh, we also have Volkswagen, their debuting concepts here. Uh, we have Chevy that's going to be debuting a, a new vehicle. Uh, there's Honda and Sony. They're going to be showing off uh, Sony's first vehicle. It's going to be a, an electric car. Uh, and then this entire hall behind me, uh, it stretches way, way down the block. It's all full of automotive technology, not just cars, though. I mean, at CES, so you're going to see flying car concepts uh, a few years back. We had uh, Uber showing off a uh, kind of uh, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle that I guess in the future will ferry us from home to work if we want. Uh, different types of autonomous boat technology. So, I mean, this show really is become kind of a transportation event. Uh, and this hall here, the West Hall, is where it's all going to be going down over the next few days. I, I really need some footage of you later uh, waving to us from an autonomous boat, please. Dan Howley, get on that. All right, thanks so much. We look forward to more of your coverage from there. Let's stick with tech now and take a look at uh, what is going on stock-wise as well, following the brutal year uh, for tech that we have been following. We're actually seeing stocks turn lower now after that economic data that we just got out a few moments ago. And here to discuss what's going on with tech right now, Independent Wealth Solutions Management Portfolio Manager Paul Meeks. Paul, it's good to see you again. What I'm guessing we're seeing here in the markets is once again, the outlook for rates perhaps feeding back to what we are seeing in stocks and in tech stocks in particular. We've talked to you before, and this is really uh, going to be a tough slog for these companies. Does anything change going into 2023? Well, as you know, I've been pretty bearish for some time, and you know, people are always asking me because I'm well known to cover the sector for a long time you know aren't there opportunities aren't there opportunities and of course there's always going to be a couple of opportunities amongst the rubble but i'm still bearish on tech i want to get at least through the next round of quarterly reports and of course they're going to be coming fast and furious in about two weeks and the news that you had out of salesforce.com today firing eight thousand people i'm expecting when we have these quarterly announcements because what will happen, since this is the fourth quarter's announcement, they'll probably guide for the next year. And I'm hoping that all of these companies uh, rip off the Band-Aid, take the opportunity that's been given to them, which is a rare opportunity, and fully reflect the recession, which is coming, into their financial forecast so we can get revenue and earnings per share estimates down low enough where even cheap stocks cannot really respond and consistently rebound until the bottom numbers are in. We have to go through that process. I'm hoping it's a first quarter phenomenon, but I'm not uh, 
uh, very confident about that. So, Paul, do you but think in the he's... meantime, I wouldn't buy a share until we get through those quarterly reports. Mm -hmm. And so you really only have to wait two or three weeks for that to uh, all play out. Paul, so do you think the Salesforce warning here, which is jarring, I mean, not many investors have seen this type of announcement, if ever, from this company. Do you think that is the tip of the iceberg in terms of tech layoffs that we might hear uh, about in the next, uh, as these companies report earnings, like you mentioned, then which companies do you think still have to trim a lot of fat like a Salesforce? So you're absolutely right. We've had, by my calculation, about uh, 300,000 tech sector layoffs uh, in the last year. But as you know, the bulk of them have come in the last couple of weeks or months, including Salesforce.com this morning. I think we'll see more. I actually expect companies, because uh, if they announce that they're going to be drastically cutting costs, including heads, which is unfortunate for those employees, but good for investors, their stocks might see a little bit of a lift. But I think all of the uh, major players, those companies that have tens of thousands, if not more employees, have probably gotten uh, fat over the years. And so I expect continued uh, trimming. Also companies within the tech sector that are beholden to consumer electronics, I expect that to continue to be in a funk. And so, yes, I don't know if it's necessarily the tip of the iceberg, but in this next reporting season, in the next couple of weeks, I expect to see more tech layoffs to the tune of tens of thousands more. Paul, what's the indicator that you would look to if we finally got companies that were ripping the Band-Aid off and at that point we probably will have been talking about a recession for a year. So with all of that considered, at what point is it so bad within tech that it's actually a bullish indicator or something that you would look to to say, okay, now's the time that investors may be willing to take on some risk tolerance? Excellent question because that's the crux of the matter. So I think we go through this a round of quarterly reports. Hopefully companies guide very ugly because it's in their benefit to do so for next year. They announce their uh, bloodletting, whether it be operational costs, including uh, trimming more heads. And then we get to a situation where it can't go any lower for revenue and EPS estimates on the street. Also, we get some clarity from the Fed. When is their last rate hike going to be? I actually think it's going to be in about the May timeframe. And if we see inflation under control, the last of the uh, Fed rate hikes, the nastiest of all possible recession nasty numbers reflected with these tech companies forecasts, I will feel pretty good. Because in the meantime, the uh, valuations on some of these tech names will be right. Hey, Paul, um, let's talk some other specific names, shall we? Because sort of the poster child for well, it sort of had its own story in 2022, didn't it? I'm talking about Tesla. I won't be coy anymore. I'll talk about Tesla. What, what do you think here? It has it gotten low enough now that it is attractive to investors? We did see a little bit of a bump in it earlier today. I think not, because remember this stock, which has come from 400 to 111 today, started 2020 at 29. So it had an enormous gap up in 20. Uh, some more good tidings in 21, but it's been a bloodbath since. But unfortunately, if you're a chartist, a technical analyst, there is no floor on this stock. Does it go all the way back down to 29? I actually, over the next couple of years, wouldn't be surprised. But here's a company that unfortunately has never had a demand problem until now. So they've always had to struggle with supply, and you have to give them some credit for actually meeting their production goals in recent years. And then you have the situation with Elon Musk. We all know that this stock is as much a cult as a company. And this fiasco with Twitter, which I think he can really drive to bankruptcy, will burn the private investors in Twitter, will frustrate a lot of people who are um, much more liberal that are buying uh, Teslas than the conservative uh, commentary coming out of Twitter. And it could be uh, particularly nasty. In the meantime, despite the fact that Twitter was down over 60% last year, it still has about 7x the market cap of both Ford and General Motors. And so uh, I'm not making the prediction. If I was interested in going long, I would not buy Tesla even here. I would not buy Tesla even significantly lower from here. I think there's all kinds of tech turnarounds that would be better positioned. But uh, yes, I would not be surprised if the stock goes much, much, much lower. 
Wow, provocative there, Paul. I want to ask about one more, um, and that is Meta, which we've talked to you about before. I'm just seeing the headline here that the European Union is now saying that Meta illegally forced users to uh, accept personalized ads, and it's fining the company 390 million euros, which is uh, about 414 million dollars. Um, and obviously, Meta has sort of been buffeted by some of these various regulatory concerns. That's one of the reasons. Uh, that it was down last year. What's your current thesis on Meta? I know you were not positive on it before. I don't know if anything's changed. Yeah, the only reason that I might be warming up to a Meta is it has a, a real business. And I don't know if the Metaverse is going to work out. Uh, I for, think of that as kind of a free call option on the stock. But in the meantime, the stock has come down a bit. It's reflecting a recessionary scenario. And even though it has lost some digital advertising share, once we get to the other side and the economy starts to firm, that business should do okay and it generates nice cash flow and the stock is now cheap enough to reflect that. Uh, as far as their legal issues, I really think they need to have a change at the top. I don't think your buddy Mark Zuckerberg was born with the uh, empathy gene and that's the new CEO that you need. Uh, we'll see what happens, but they should have some spring back to life. I'm much more bullish on Meta than I am Tesla with a recovery in the U.S. and global economies that will bring back some uh, digital advertising revenues, which is a very profitable, high cash flow business. And then we'll worry about uh, regulatory stuff, Mark Zuckerberg, and even the metaverse later. Paul Meeks, Independent Wealth Solutions Management. Thanks for bringing these hot takes. This is what our audience likes to hear and see. Thanks so much, Paul. Appreciate it. I'm with you, brother. <laughs> what recession? Jeffrey's analyst Ashley Helgens is making a big call on coach and Kate Spade owner Tapestry. Helgens has made Tapestry her top fashion stock pick for this year, says Helgens. While the macroeconomic environment remains uncertain, we believe Tapestry over-indexes on industry defensibility, company-specific initiatives and catalysts, attractive valuation, quality of management, and favorable capital allocation. Moreover, China's reopening, although likely volatile near-term, is, is a positive and will improve investor sentiment. Coming up, video game workers have officially formed Microsoft's first union in the U.S. Julie's got the latest, plus more top headlines you need to know next.
Let's get down to business now. Look at some of the other top stories that we are watching in business and beyond. The European Union is working on a coordinated response to China's COVID-19 surge. Measures could include travel restrictions or mandatory testing of passengers from China. The spike in COVID-19 comes as China abruptly loosened strict lockdowns following protests and has ceased publishing daily case and mortality data. China has voiced its disapproval of travel restrictions and says it will impose countermeasures if any restrictions are taken. Workers at a Microsoft unit have voted to form a labor union. The stock was down after that UBS downgrade we talked about earlier. This would be the tech giant's first U.S.-based group. The 300 or so quality assurance workers hail from Microsoft's ZeniMax video game unit, which owns Fallout and Elder Scrolls developer Bethesda Studios. The workers will be represented by the Communications Workers of America, and the move comes as a countrywide unionization drive continues, with companies like Chipotle and Starbucks seeing unions form within their ranks. And Southwest Airlines is offering an official apology to customers affected by massive holiday travel snarls that included nearly 16,000 flight cancellations across the country. That apology includes 25,000 frequent flyer points atop of refunds and reimbursements for lost bags. But that points rollout hit snags of its own, including long waits to add points to people's accounts. The company remains under fire for its handling of the holiday snags, with the Biden administration vowing to hold Southwest accountable if it does not fulfill commitments. Sass? The FDA is changing rules around abortion pills that would make the medicine more readily available. The move comes as the abortion fight intensifies after the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Joining us with details and more on the new rules is Yahoo Finance senior health care reporter Anjali Kamladi. Anjali. That is right, Brian. So, uh, of course, we know that there has been some concern after the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and the FDA has now allowed one of the two pills used in uh, uh, pill-induced abortions to be dispensed by pharmacies and online and make it more widely available. As you see on your screen, those are the two pills by their generic names and underneath the brands. Um, Mifepristone is the one that now the FDA has approved. Misoprostol is the one that has already been available. It's also used for things like uh, treating ulcers. So it has been available, but Mifepristone now available with, uh, you know, some, uh, sorry, with a, a uh, approval uh, by the pharmacies, they would have to then request it. They would have to get the clearance for it and then allow to then distribute it. This comes at a time where states are also looking to fight. We've seen certain uh, conservative states fight against the access to some of these pills. And so it'll really be interesting to see how that pans out and where these pills will then be available. But as of right now, the FDA loosening up access a little bit after what has happened during the pandemic. We've seen, uh, you know, more and more uh, push to online pharmacy and online dispensing uh, as a result of the loosening of rules that the FDA took took during the pandemic. And the result of that has been there were studies that looked at whether or not this could be done. So that's the result of what you're seeing right now. So looking at the drugs themselves, there's, there's two major medications yeah. that could see an impact from this rule change. What more do we know about this? So mifepristone, the, that's the major one that's yeah. a part of this, right? That's the one that stops the abortion in its, I mean, sorry, it stops, stops the pregnancy in its tracks. And then the one after misoprostol, that's the one that results in uh, ejecting everything from your uterus. So that is the uh, follow-up treatment to what is going on. So that's why those two are the important names to remember. The first one, Mifepristone, is the one that had been ha had more restrictions, and now that's the one that is being released. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Please. Who makes these? And, like, are these, I mean, aside from the story of access, yeah. which is obviously a very important part of the story, Supply. Uh, su supply and, and who makes them and it, are these profitable drugs for them? Is this going to make them more profitable if they're more or more lucrative if they're more readily available? I think the idea that they're more readily available, they have always been available. They just haven't been available in the medium that they have now. Mm. This is more of a place of access than actual access. So uh, the two companies, Gen, Gen Pro Bio and, or Gen Bio Pro and Danko are the ones that make these two. Uh, it's, uh, that make Mifepristone. And they, uh, yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're not names that you know. They're not the big pharma names that you know. So definitely an interesting sort of niche opportunity for them. Excellent breakdown as always. We appreciate it. Yahoo Finance's own Anjali Kamlani. Coming up, everyone, a fresh start to your fitness journey. We're going to speak with Planet Fitness CEO Chris Rondeau on his expectations for the new year. There he is. Chris, hang Chris around for a hot second.
Shares of U.S. listed Chinese companies are rising today after Ant Group gained approval to more than double its registered capital for its consumer finance business. Yahoo Finance's Inez Ferre has the latest yet another overhang maybe removed from uh, Chinese stocks, Inez. Yeah, that's right, Julie. And this is really seen as a move perhaps of easing concerns about uh, regulatory uh, crackdowns against uh, tech companies and also seen as a move of perhaps regulators putting growth over anything else after the lockdowns in China, a slowing economy worldwide. So let's take a look at our interactive board to see where we're at with some of these Chinese ADRs. We are looking at Baba Alibaba up more than 7%, Alibaba's finance affiliate and group, as you had mentioned mentioned uh, receiving approval from regulators to increase its registered capital. Uh, remember that Ant Group had planned an IPO back in 2020 that then uh, was shelved uh, by regulators. Also taking a look at JD.com, that stock is up more than 9% and Pinduo Duo is up more than 7%. Over the last two days, we have seen gains for the Chinese ADRs. And really, if we pull up a two-month chart, you can see that uh, easing of lockdowns, a reopening of China. China has had sent these stocks higher, guys. All right. Yahoo Finance's own Inez Ferre keeping close tabs on some of the uh, China-based stocks as well that we're tracking here today. Thanks so much, Inez. Appreciate it. Switching gears here. New year, new resolutions. January is a notoriously popular month for gyms as people double down on their fitness goals. And Planet Fitness is looking to capitalize by kicking off 2023 with a new offer. Dollar down, $10 a month through January 12th here. Here with us this morning, we've got Planet Fitness CEO Chris Rondeau joining us now. Chris, always a pleasure to see you. Of course, many people probably see the brand over the course of the New Year's Eve celebrations, and then things get real once people start to get back in the gym. So what type of uptick versus years past are you anticipating or are you forecasting for this year? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Brian. Brad, this is great. You know, this is a, uh, it's hard to believe this industry has, this would be the first uninterrupted first quarter in four years, believe it or not, knock on wood, right? Uh, you know, in January, you know, we're seeing a lot of momentum out of the Q3 into the new year here. And uh, we had the big new year celebration in Times Square. And you're right, the dollar down 10 a month promotion we're doing this right now, which is our annual promotion we always do in January. But, you know, last year we had Omicron and that's not here today. So it's, it's really, really great news for the industry and great news for Planet. Hey, Chris, it's Julie here. So if we go back to pre-COVID times and look at usual patterns, what does the attrition rate tend to be? I always wonder about that in terms of January signups and then who sticks around? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, as you probably recall, Planet Fitness, we catered to casual first-time gym goers, and almost 40% of our joints have never gone to a gym in their entire life. So we're really their first, their first venture into fitness. And that's why we always offer a no-commitment, cancel-anytime membership. You know, we get them off the hook the first time, and naturally, not all everybody sticks with it. We try to get them to come in. The beauty of it is we get you off the couch the first time, Julie, you'll always come back your second time to plan it. So, you know, it's really, we don't really watch it that much the first year. We just want to put everybody into the gym. Hopefully they're comfortable. If they fall off the wagon, we hear when they're ready to come back. Chris, you've been in this industry since what? The mid to late 90s. And then you've seen probably every promotion and marketing gimmick known to known to man. Well, what do you think about this Equinox promotion? I mean, they, they didn't let people sign up on New Year's New Year's Day or after New Year's saying, we don't, we don't want your business. Uh, if you're not working out all year round and paying us $200 a month, we don't want you. What do you think about this? And isn't this everything wrong with the high-end gym industry at this point? You know, honestly, Brian, that's a lot of reason why Planet Fitness got into this industry to begin with. It's a judgment-free zone is what we call ourselves, right? And, you know, regardless of what your why is and the reason you want to get off the couch, whether it's January 1st, July 1st, you know, you're doing it for your kids, you're doing it because you want to feel better, have more energy. You know, we don't judge. So, yeah, I, I saw that, but, you know, that's not us. Chris, a uh, question on the franchisee front. I, I mean, when you think about the business model, the structure that Planet Fitness has set up for so long and the strength of that on new locations being opened up, I mean, this mm -hmm. is going to be a kind of pre-recession environment that we continue to find ourselves in. And those franchisees, what has the environment for them in financing and being able to open up new locations been like? Have you seen any softness or weakness in that? Yeah, we're starting to get a lot of momentum now. You know, we did see some slowdown naturally during COVID. Um, but luckily, our franchisees are extremely strong. Most of them have been in our system since day one. And uh, we only have about 120 franchisees that make up the 2,000 plus stores. So they're all multi store operators and very well capitalized and very sophisticated. So, you know, the financing side of things is not really that much of an issue for us. More of it's just supply chain. And believe it or not, out of all things that have slowed us down a little bit was air conditioning, <laughs> finding that for the units. Um, equipment's coming through fine, the flooring's coming through fine. 
fine. The firing location is okay. It's just really just air conditioning and, and heating. But but that that's only temporary, naturally. So um, but they're all bullish. They've seen the memberships like we have corporately, and and they're excited to get building stores again and 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 get more people off the couch. Chris, have you changed any kind of expansion plans for this year, given the economic slowdown that is expected? No, we just continue to help our franchisees find locations. We did announce we're going to New Zealand this coming year. Uh, this year, naturally, uh, this year actually, um, later this year, we'll open our first store in New Zealand. That'll make mark our sixth country that we're in today. Um, but no, just continue to open stores. Our U.S. potential is 4,000 just domestically. And, and honestly, since COVID, you've probably heard me talk about this. 25% of the gyms in the country of the U.S. have closed permanently because of COVID. So I think that 4,000 could really be the floor of our potential here, not our ceiling any longer. And uh, we're at, you know, over 2,300 stores now and just continue to build out our markets. The street is really banking on uh, Planet Fitness making a, a really big international push. You just mentioned New Zealand, Chris. What is the international potential and what other markets will you hit this year and next year? Yeah, we were always doing like a country a year, Brian. I think our going forward future plans is probably we'd try to do two or three a year um, on top of what we have open today. Um, we've looked at Asia and we've also looked overseas here in Europe. So so uh, we're very, very careful and methodical about where we go next. We don't want to do just 10 countries out of the blue and open one store each. We really want to find the right partner in each place and have a right plan and just start building these things out. We'll leave it there. Planet Fitness CEO Chris Rondo, always good to see you. And I should note it's back day for me uh, as well later on. Chris, good to see you. Happy New Year. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Have a good day. You too. Coming, up, <laughs> coming up, we'll do a deep dive into the courtroom proceedings for FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed. Stick around. Sam Bangman free pleaded not guilty to federal fraud charges Tuesday. He could face up to 115 years in prison if convicted. Meanwhile, the Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office is launching an FTX task force to recover assets of victims from the crypto exchange's collapse. Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith and Alexis Keenan join us now with the latest. Um, and Alexis has been covering sort of the legal ins and outs of this. David, you were in the courtroom yesterday, so I actually want to start with you. Um, just tell us what it was like there. What it uh, kind of what was Sam Bankman Fried's vibe, for example, as you were watching? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, there's a. I, I think the best way to explain it is, is uh, you know, if you've never been a part of a, a criminal proceeding, which uh, you know, I'm I was fairly new to it too at the time, is that um, you know, there's actually a lot of rapport between the defense and the Justice Department, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that there is a little bit of. Uh, um, you know, this uh, defense team in particular are 
former um, uh, members of uh, attorneys for the United States. So there's a there's a little bit of uh, under there's a clear understanding. There's some negotiations that are mm. that are happening outside of the courts, and you know that could um, happen and that could continue to happen until um, the trial, which obviously is set for October. Second, so um, all that being said, uh, SBF was actually seemed to be in higher spirits than one would expect, and maybe that's because this arraignment hearing was, you know, somewhat um, it was sort of obvious what would happen at that point. Right. Um, and there's more time. I mean, I, I think as far as an October second trial dates, he's probably pretty happy about that. But um, you know, I, I was not ex see, expecting to, I did not see what I expected to be someone who was, you know, in the throes of having to deal with what right. he's dealt with. Wow. And so, Alexis, I mean, even though this was just the arraignment hearing, what steps take place next within this broader proceeding now? So the case will go through a discovery process, and that means that both sides will get an opportunity to work up their cases. So in that time, there will also be potential evidence that will continue to come out. We've already heard a lot because we've heard FTX's management testify before Congress. So that's really unusual in a criminal case like this, especially this kind of scope, to have heard all that already. But there's a couple other things that happened in court yesterday that I think we should point out. One is that the Justice Department, the prosecutors in the Southern District, they made a request to amend and uh, Sam Bankman Free's bond. And what they wanted is to bar him from accessing or transferring any more FTX funds. So that's a new condition that was put on. The attorney's also slipping in seemingly an allegation saying that he had helped foreign regulators transfer FTX assets that are being sought by the U.S. bankruptcy and the U.S. management. So uh, also, uh, for now, the judge also granted a request by San Bankman frieds attorneys, and that is a request to, they came in a letter, to seal the names of two of his guarantors on that $250 million bond. So right now, the judge said, we will consider that to be under seal for the moment, so those names are not going to be released. However, there has already been a filing uh, that has come from the press saying the public has a right to know who these people are because this is a financial fraud and we need to know where the money's going. And speaking of where the money's going, this task force, David, that is now started up. I mean, we saw this after Madoff, right? The long process of trying to claw back some of that money, to find some of that money. What is this process going to look like? Totally. I, the, so the Justice uh, Department or um, uh, the Ma Manhattan, uh, Damian Williams' office has sort of said yesterday um, that they're, they've assembled this task force. Um, and uh, we don't have a clear idea of, of um, how big it will be at this point, but we can tell that um, there's a lot to do. I mean, just as recently as, as last week, um, there was theft of uh, cryptocurrency from um, Alameda, one of Alameda's wallets. And obviously this came up in court and it was a huge issue for whether or not SBF um, was a part of it. Um, and while that hasn't been proven to be true, people need to figure out what's going on. And th this is the kind of thing that has happened um, continually since the case has started or since FTX has filed for bankruptcy. So um, there's that issue. Then there's this whole issue of uh, market m manipulation um, that might not even have anything to do with uh, FTX uh, bankruptcy um, assets, but still could have affected cryptocurrency markets. So it's, it's quite ri wide ranging in terms of um, you know, what is on the table now that they're getting these, you know, these high volumes of, of, of information and data. Well, there, there's also the question of SPF's donations, right? There's been right. calls for various politicians and political groups to give them back. But who do you give them to? I guess it's, I guess they would give them to an entity like this, maybe. I mean, it's, you don't give them back to him, clearly. You would give them to the people who have lost money, right? Uh, yeah, I, I mean... I, Alexis, you might have a better idea, but I feel like it would go to the bankruptcy estate. Hmm. Well, that would be that my sense. guess, is that they would ask, ask for it to be returned to the estate, but then you have the added problem of how is the bankruptcy going to handle customer funds? That's been right. a problem in other cur uh, cryptocurrency bankruptcy with uh, Cred and Voyager. And so where those uh, customers of FTX will fall on the creditor hierarchy, that's a big question. They have a much better chance in the case of FTX than they did with Voyager and Cred. They may be up higher on that uh, hierarchy, but uh, that remains to be seen. So, but. I would guess that they would be asking for those funds to be returned to the bankruptcy estate. Interesting. Full team coverage. Alexis Keenan, David Holler, mm -hmm. thanks so much.
Straight ahead, the big breakup of General Electric begins today as the company's health care division goes public. We'll talk to the company's CEO next. Medical equipment maker G Healthcare is now making its own moves. The company completed its split from parent G with its very own public market debut under the ticker symbol GEHC. The company immediately replaced Vornado in the S&P 500 and enters a med tech field that's increasingly crowded but could have room to grow. Joining us now is G Healthcare CEO Peter Arduini. Peter, good to see you and congrats on this listing. I know a lot of work goes into this stuff, especially uh, inside of GE when, ma uh, when making this happen. So take us through this. Why was it so important to, to split off from the parent company and what will you be able to do now? Yeah, Brian, look, thanks for having me this morning. It's it's obviously, it's a big day for us here as our, our spin day, we, we rang the bell at our facility in Wisconsin. And, you know, as a $18 billion revenue company, you know, we've got lots of capabilities and, and we have a long history of innovation. But I think to your question about being a more focused agile company in a world that's becoming more digital, it just really sets us up to perform, I, I believe at a different level. This is my one year anniversary with the company. And people have been super energized about our opportunity to be separate. It's brought, you know, more employees of, of, of capabilities into the company. It's enabled us to kind of simplify how we run the company. And ultimately, uh, it's about capital allocation uh, over the long run. So we're quite excited about what we believe we can do here in the, in the future. And, and honestly, have been able to demonstrate some of that in the second half of, of 22. Within that capital allocation, uh, I think about the amount that's being spent on R&D and that research and development, of course, significant for the healthcare industry at large, but for GE Healthcare, when do you expect many, much of that R&D allocation uh, to start to become accretive to the business as well over an extended period of time? Yeah, great question. So I, I think one of the things that I was very fortunate to, to benefit from uh, was, you know, as Larry Culp came into the organization X years back, there was definitely an increased infusion of R&D monies that, that came into GE Healthcare. I mean, we, we grew our R&D funds from around 700 million to over a billion dollars in the last few years. And so what's happened is in the last two years, we've been able to come out with some breakthrough leadership products, products that have really put us in number one positions in different categories. So that's the engine we have. And it allowed me to really start on commercial execution as one of the key enablers in the near term but obviously ongoing investments in R&D, particularly digital and our imaging platforms is gonna be important for us in the future. 
So, Peter, you're painting a good picture of sort of the identity of GE Healthcare as a standalone, but I want to go a little bit deeper into that, especially with regard to your competition, which is pretty ample, right? You've got uh, Johnson & Johnson, you've got Siemens, you've got Philips, Medtronic, all of these guys are also in the med tech space. So now that you're independent, how should investors think about you as distinct from some of those competitors? Yeah, no, look, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think what really separates us is that we touch many of the disease states around the world, many of the oncology-based disease states, cardiology, musculoskeletal, and we generate a, a big portion of the data. And so understanding the care pathways that are out there and how do you convert that data into insights, which again is much more than just making the best next device. We're really well positioned to do that. We actually have a digital platform called Edison which is enabler to bring multiple components of data together so the clinician can make a better decision. And so I would argue, if you take a look at the class of med tech companies out there, we're one of the folks, very few, that really has the ability to kind of take healthcare to the next level with turning data into insights. And that's really what we intend to do. Peter, my sense from just following GE for a while, and of course looking at the healthcare business, that more recently has been driven by the imaging business inside of North America. How is the international business of Europe and of China doing at this point in the economic cycle? Yeah, actually uh, it, it's been through COVID, as you know, from many different companies, there's been different lumpiness in our numbers, but our international business, which is over 58% of our business has actually been quite strong. Uh, our coming out of the, the COVID window in Europe particularly and our intercontinental business, there's been increased spending in the public healthcare markets to increase capabilities because many uh, providers saw the need with centralized health systems to actually have more outpatient centers. So we're benefiting from that growth and we, we expect that to continue into the future. And then markets such as China obviously have had challenges in the near term, but we see that as significant amount of pent up demand here as we go into to 23. So internationally, OUS has been quite strong and, and US uh, this year has been a, a solid market and we will expect as uh, we turn into 23 and 24, Many of these trends uh, of chronic disease, um, older population, the need for follow-up procedures to deliver more precision, we're well positioned to, uh, to deliver on that. How have the lead times been on delivering equipment in some of those orders that you are seeing come through? Yeah, I think the short answer is in the first half of 22, they were longer than they were in the, in the second half of 22. And, and, and much of that, has come down to access to different parts and chips, you know, no different than what you heard in automotive industry, let alone other parts within healthcare. But because of our scale and reach and our global manufacturing footprint, I think we've fared better than, than many other uh, players within our direct competitive space and, and broader, uh, just because of the, the, the capabilities we have in our global supply chain. And, and look, in some cases, we took the, the risk to say, if we can acquire the right parts to be able to get the full product shipped, we actually did that this year, which meant we prioritized patients and customers first. And I think it was totally the right uh, decision for us. GE Healthcare CEO, Peter, Peter Arduini. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time here with us today. And congratulations for this major milestone for GE Healthcare as well. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Certainly. Look to check back in in the future. Guys, coming up, Twitter is looking to expand its political ad policies. We're going to discuss that next.
It's time for Cut for Time. Two stories today. We've got one minute on the clock for each. We will start with this. Elon Musk's Twitter plans to expand the political advertising allowed on the site. Following a ban of most political-based ads in 2019, the company has now announced via a tweet that it would align advertising policy with that of TV and other media outlets here. They're taking a look at the tweet on your screen, just more notably within that tweet saying that we're relaxing their ads policy for cause-based ads in the U.S., planning to expand the political advertising they permitted in the coming weeks. This was a step that was taken actually prior to the 2020 general election, trying to curb any misinformation that would have been placed within ads on the platform. Yeah, and at the time, Jack Dorsey said that political will, ha political influence had to be earned, mm. not bought, which I thought was interesting. So this is yet another thing that to Despite the buddy-buddy relationship, supposedly, that Musk and Dorsey had, it's a decision that Musk is reversing that, that Dorsey had made. Elon, looking to get paid, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the bottom line, right? Is At that... the expense of civilization. <laughs> that is a good yeah. summary of the situation. Like that, right? I knew that. I knew you'd like that. Well, I appreciate that. All right, Roku is rolling out its very own smart TV in hopes of creating a better TV experience for its users. The Roku Select and Plus Series TVs will be available beginning spring 2023 with prices ranging from, wow, $119 to $999 for HD and 4K models. A little bit of a, so Roku has been in TV, but it ha, TV for some time uh, using really partnerships, I believe, with TCL. So the Roku players come embedded, uh, that technology comes embedded in TVs. I'm surprised to see them get into this lower margin opportunities of getting into TV. I, I just think of the terrible market response that video, Vizio has gotten since it went mm. public about a year ago. That market cap now is at $1.4 billion. I would have thought maybe Roku just goes out and buys that company if they really want to make TVs. Yeah, I think... <sighs> I mean, the old adage, of course, hardware is hard, and that is going to be immediately discovered when you're trying to move through televisions at any point in the year that is an off-cycle purchasing period for consumers. And typically, a lot of those deals happen when the margins are not they're, they're, they're not the best for the companies themselves. It gets moved through when there's heavy discounting during the Black Friday holiday shopping season. Sorry, I took up so, too So it's a softball oh, soft. Yeah. Was it, it's it was, a softball soft. It's a softball, so it's softer. Softer, okay. Hardware, <laughs> hardware is hard, softball is soft. <laughs> Wisdom from these guys. Runs a bound. All right, let's take a look at uh, stocks before we leave you because we have seen things turn positive once again. We started the day positive, we dipped negative around 10 a.m. Now we are back in the green, but the NASDAQ is still lagging uh, for the three major averages, or at least it's lagging the S&P 500. So we're going to continue to track that action. And coming up in the next hour, Akiko Fujita and Rochelle Akufa will take you through the next hour, including a conversation on Tesla with an analyst from S&P Global Ratings. Stay with us. <laughs>
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast and 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa along with Akiko Fujita, and here's a look at what we're watching. A House divided, the lower chamber of Congress at a standstill after the first failed speaker vote in 100 years. Kevin McCarthy vows to fight on, but his opponents in the GOP seem just as resilient. We'll take a look at some contenders for the seat if he doesn't make it through. And electric shock, Tesla shares push higher amid buying from Kathy Wood and as the likes of Dan Ives at Wedbush call the stock way oversold. We look at the opportunities for EV rivals amid growing competition and concern over demand in China. And Peepuck, yes, you heard it right. One company has come up with a gadget you mount in your toilet to keep track of your health. Well, Dan Howley has been testing it out. I'll leave that to your imagination as we're live at the world's biggest tech conference this hour. But first, let's take a look at how the major indices are faring. We see all three in relatively positive territory. You see the Dow, they're just up barely about, about just almost two tenths of a percent, about 65 points. You see the S&P 500 up about half a percent and the tech heavy Nasdaq there up about a third of a percent. Obviously, there was some oscillation during morning trading, but at least remaining in positive territory for now. Let's also take a look at what we're seeing with the Treasury market as well. We're seeing a situation there, all three in negative territory. We're seeing the five-year down about 2%, the 10-year down about 2.5%, and the 30-year down, the longer term, yields there down about two and two-tenths of a percent, relatively flat as well. All right, well, the House will come back into session at noon today as Kevin McCarthy's bid to capture the speakership hangs in the balance. Now, McCarthy's failure to become Speaker of the House, however, opens the door for other lawmakers to step in. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman is here to break all of this, this historical event down for us. Rick, incredible stuff. A hundred years since we've seen something like this. Right. And unlike a lot of political drama inside the Beltway, where everybody has to take a public stance uh, for a while, but everybody knows what the uh, final outcome is going to be. The final outcome here is completely unclear. Uh, and uh, the analysis at the beginning of the morning was that it was looking increasingly unlikely that McCarthy would just have to bow out at some point. But then we got a new wrinkle, which is uh, former President Donald Trump on his uh, Truth Social uh, uh, pr uh, platform. He said, can all the Republicans please get behind uh, McCarthy because he will do a, gr a good job and possibly a great job. So the interesting part about that, I mean, there are many interesting parts, but the holdouts, the people who will not vote for McCarthy in the Republican Party are mainly conservative hardliner, hardliners who tend to be um, uh, the staunchest Trumpers among the Republican Party. So that's members of the Freedom Caucus. So will those people uh, listen to Donald Trump and heed his instructions and get in line behind McCarthy? Or are they just going to say, hey, we love you, Donald, but um, on this one, we're not following your orders, uh, which will force McCarthy to bow out and maybe lead to somebody else getting uh, uh, the speaker's nod or at least stepping in to see if they can uh, win enough votes. So this is going to this is going to we're going to find out in a couple of hours here where this is going to go. Um, I don't know if we're going to have an answer by the end of today, by the end of this week, or even by the end of this month. This is um, quite uh, up in the air. Yeah, and it pretty much puts everything at a standstill here, even those who are coming into the House, right? These new lawmakers can't even get sworn in without this in place. We've gone three rounds now. There are other names that have emerged. I mean, how realistic is it that Kevin McCarthy doesn't get this and potentially maybe in the fourth round today we see somebody else emerge as potential House Speaker? It's very plausible. It's very plausible that McCarthy ends up not getting it. Um, so who, who else might get it? Um, and the so there's the before the Trump, you know, there's before the Trump post and after the Trump post. But so before the Trump post, it looked like uh, Steve Scalise um, might be the guy who could step in and get enough votes from the uh, rabble rousers on the far right, if you will, and uh, traditional Republicans to get over the hump and get the 218 votes that are necessary. Um, and if it's not uh, Steve Scalise, I, I don't know who it could be. I mean, you see some other names there, but. Uh, Jim, Jim Jordan actually is backing McCarthy. He's not, he's not actually running for the post. Patrick McHenry, um, he has a lot of support, but he said he doesn't want the job. Uh, Elise Stefanik, um, would she get enough uh, support from the middle? She is, has become kind of another type of Trump hardliner. So 
Um, it's hard to see uh, anybody getting it, but of course somebody somebody has to become speaker here. So I think the question is who who is going to which faction is going to wilt first or just throw in the towel first? And um, I, I would not bet that it is the uh, 19 or 20 holdouts voting against McCarthy because uh, they are the bomb throwers, and this is what they stand for. They stand for blowing up uh, the traditional system. In favor of what we don't know, but they are the ones who just are against the establishment, and they seem like the last ones um, to give up on this fight. Uh, there's another wrinkle, Rick, uh, that I've been wondering about, and it, it is what exactly can the Democrats do to quote bail out somebody like McCarthy, for example? We heard obviously <laughs> yesterday, yeah. you know, somebody like Hakeem Jeffries, now House Democratic leader, Democrats saying they're united. You got the 200, you know, 12 votes there. But is there anything that Democrats can do the longer this drags on? Why would they? Uh, I, I've seen the same thing, Akiko. Um, and the theory here is that um, if fewer Democrats showed up, I mean, just to get into how this happened. So uh, to get to become Speaker of the House, you have to get a majority of the votes of people of uh, members who are present in the chamber. That's not a majority of all the members of the chamber. So if a bunch of Democrats didn't show up, uh, then the size of the quorum would shrink. And in theory, McCarthy could get elected with fewer votes. Um, and that might allow him to have more holdouts, more Republicans voting against him. But why would Republicans do that? I mean, there are no nice guys uh, in, in battles like this. And uh, remember, everybody's thinking about 2024. And uh, the more dysfunctional the Republicans look uh, now that they have control, or maybe let's hope they originally, uh, initially get control of this House of Congress, the more dysfunctional they look, the better that is for Democrats in 2024, because they can say, you really want these guys running Congress or, or running the White House? Look at what a disaster it was. They couldn't even decide, they couldn't even elect their own leader. So it is in Democrats' interest to let this problem just continue to explode for as long as it does. And I, I just don't buy the idea that uh, Democrats might somehow help McCarthy win or uh, help get to a conclusion here, because politically it's in, it's in their interest not to. And we, do, we, we are not on the verge of any must pass legislation that just has to get through Congress during the next few days or weeks. So um, Democrats, uh, the old political adage is when, you're, when your opponents are making mistakes, get out of the way and let them continue to make those mistakes. And I think that is exactly what the Democrats are gonna continue to do. Yeah, it is fascinating to watch. And we've got, what, the fourth round of voting uh, set to get underway in about an hour or so. So we will all be watching there. Rick Newman, thanks so much for breaking yeah. that down for us. Well, shifting now to a main focus on the markets at the start of this year, we're taking a look at the health of the tech sector as the value of technology companies take a dive or took a dive in 2022. Rochelle, yesterday we were looking at some of the big tech names First day of trading, Tesla, a big focus there. It has bounced back today, but we saw $25 billion roughly worth of Tesla shares change hands yesterday. And this is really an extension of the sell that we saw at the end of the year, the worst one day drop that Tesla has seen since September of 8th of 2020. A lot of this is about the demand picture. You know, the conversation has kind of shifted from is it a distraction for Elon Musk with Twitter, him running Twitter and Tesla. Now it is about the demand picture. And it's not just Tesla. It also demand pictures emerging for or demand concerns emerging for a company like Apple. Both of these companies, investors looking at China to say, well, is that demand going to continue? And it's hard because obviously we saw tech sell off over 2022, but then even within the picture, as we look at the interactive here, if we look at some of the individual stories that are also tied to this, for example, if we look at what's dragging down the NASDAQ today, we see Microsoft down there almost five and a half percent. And that's after a UBS downgrade. We saw that, they, that UBS downgraded it over concerns about slowing growth for its cloud services and its office suite, downgraded it to, to neutral from buy, cut the price target by $50 to $250. So how much of this is an individual tech story versus other issues that we're seeing? We're seeing also Google Alphabet there down about one and a half percent on the day as well. But as we look, if we do it as equal weight here, we see that the picture doesn't look too bad, at least for today. But as you look at how things have progressed over the past year, a lot more red when it comes to this tech space. People looking for opportunities, wondering, are some of these companies cheap enough to buy? Could they go lower? We are still expecting some of these valuations to continue to fall, at least for the first quarter of this year. So people keeping an eye on this, but still trying to figure out where they should be parking their money at the moment. Yeah, and worth noting, you know, Apple 
back above the $2 trillion market cap, but we saw it fall below that yesterday for the first time in 19 months. And, and, you know, the reason I bring up sort of the China question here is because when you think about those two companies that have been so much in focus, when you look at a name like Apple as well as Tesla, a big chunk of the revenue does come from China. In the case of Apple, it's about 17 percent of sales. Tesla, it's almost 25 percent. So if that demand picture over there doesn't look good, there's going to be a big concern for investors as well. But to your point, when you look at the broader tech sector, there is a reckoning that's been going on from 2022 leading into where we are today about whether, in fact, these high growth companies can maintain that kind of growth. You could certainly see investor skepticism around that. But we heard yesterday, right, from guests who said, look, this is actually a good time to get in on these stocks because of the dip. It's true. You know, people wondering, obviously, you can't time the market. They say time in the market. So it might be a, a, longer ter a longer term view that people might have to take right now. Well, investors, of course, also keeping an eye out for December's labor data as job openings come in higher than expected, clocking in at nearly 10.46 million, the number of available jobs there in the U.S. Now, here to provide some more color on the labor market picture is Aaron Terezas, Glassdoor chief economist. Thank you for joining us today, Aaron. So first, I want to get your reaction to what we've seen with these jolts numbers. No, thank you for having me, Rochelle. And it was a reasonably strong report. I, I don't think so many people have ever been so disappointed by such good news. Um, you know, most people were looking for a little bit of a dip in hiring and job openings, given all of the headlines about tech layoffs. But it's, it's easy to forget that tech is a relatively tiny part of the overall economy, even if it holds a disproportionate uh, size in our collective consciousness. So, Aaron, what does that tell you about how much further the Fed needs to go, how much more aggressively it needs to move if it is, about, in fact, partly about weakening the job market? You know, the labor market has been stubbornly strong and the Fed has explicitly said that they are looking for wage growth to slow. I think we'll actually get a better, better picture of what's going on later this week with the jobs report. Of course, the jolts data were for November, and we know that a lot changed in December with layoffs accelerating. Um, and, and I think, you know, most of the consensus for this Friday's jobs report is for, you know, a reasonably strong continuation of the trend we've seen. I'm a little bit more bearish than that consensus. I think job growth will come in you know, a little bit below what we've seen over the past few months. And Aaron, I know we talk a lot about the tech layoffs and it's not necessarily representing what's happening across all industries, but when you look at some of these sectors and these jobs that are actually seeing the biggest wage growth or the highest salaries, what are we looking at right now? Sure, it's important to keep in mind, as you note, that the, sure, the labor market, we're hoping to see it slow, but more importantly, it's changing. And so while there have been kind of layoffs in, in, in some of the, the tech sector, there are a lot of other parts of the economy that continue to grow, continue to hire people. And you know, when it comes to the types of jobs that they're hiring, we are seeing a two-track labor market. At the high end of the labor market, you know, softening and slowing. At the bottom end of the labor market, still a lot of demand. And so what that means is that we actually could see job wage growth accelerate as more and more jobs shift toward the lower, lower wage occupations, which tend to have higher percentage gains in terms of uh, wage growth. We'll all be watching with a big number coming out on Friday. Aaron Tarasas, Glassdoor Chief Economist, appreciate your time today. Well, reports of job cuts are lifting shares of Salesforce in this session. That stock is up nearly 3% now. The software giant announcing this morning it's laying off 10% of its workforce or 8,000 employees in the face of, in their words, a more challenging economic environment. CEO Mark Benioff also saying that Salesforce is scaling back its office space, telling employees in a letter the company expanded too aggressively during the pandemic. It's just the latest tech company to slash jobs. More than 150,000 tech employees were laid off last year. That's at least according to jobs tracker layoffs.fyi. The company estimates the changes will cost roughly $2.1 billion. Well, coming up, Kathy Wood to the rescue. Funds backed by ARK Investment snap up shares of Tesla amid its biggest plunge since 2020. Is that conviction enough for you to take a dip? We speak with S&P Global on its investment grade rating. That's going up next.
One of the year's biggest tech conferences is set to officially kick off tomorrow, setting the stage for breakthrough technologies and global innovators. Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley is a step ahead of the action as usual and has seen two products that have already got people talking. So Dan, what caught your eye? That's right, Rochelle, we're here at CES 2023. You can see behind me, they're still setting up. The show officially launches tomorrow. We got to get in here a little bit early. I just want to give you an idea of just the wild different technologies we're seeing here. Uh, before I drop into those first two that you, you're discussing, I just want to point out the 100 ton autonomous dump truck standing behind me. Uh, it's probably the biggest thing that uh, you'll see at the show. Absolutely wild. But the other products that we're showing uh, or, or seen so far, the first is one of the most talked about. It's from Withings. It's called the U-Scan. Believe it or not, this is a health device, sits in your toilet uh, and basically scans your, uh, let's just say it as it is, it scans your urine to see how healthy you are over time. It comes in a puck, uh, it captures uh, the wastewater, uh, if we want to put it that way. Uh, it can tell uh, women uh, as far as health tracking goes, uh, uh, different cycles, and then uh, for everybody, it'll be able to tell you how healthy you are. They say that uh, these kinds of scans are incredibly important for overall body health, uh, and so they're offering this uh, to professionals and consumers. Uh, you get about 100 tests, uh, they'll last about three months, it's $30 a month, so an absolutely wild device here. And again, one of the most talked about that we've seen so far. The other is even crazier. It's a completely wireless television. It's a 55 inch OLED TV that uses hot swappable batteries. This is by the company Displace uh, and it's less than 20 pounds. We saw the, the team pick it up and carry it around. I didn't want to get my grubby mitts on it just yet because I didn't want to drop it. Uh, and it's uh, expected to last uh, a month on a charge. This is a, a TV uh, that doesn't require any wires whatsoever. And on top of that, it can stick to any surface. So you can push it up against a, a window, it'll stick to it. Push it up against a wall, it'll stick to it. You can combine it with another TV, make it even larger display. So these are just some of the wild types of technologies that we're seeing here at CES 2023. And the show hasn't even officially started. You can expect even more from us for the rest of the week. And Dan, I know it's always fun when you go to these tech conferences to get hands on with things. I want to know if you can actually take that dump truck for a ride. It's autonomous, you said, right? Look, they got a platform. They got a platform up in the, the bed. I was talking to them before. So we can get up there uh, and just look around. They have a whole experience. There's a, a, a setup over here where you can uh, pretend to use a, a robotic excavator. I mean, we have uh, John Deere has this huge setup directly uh, uh, in front of what I'm facing. Uh, our producer Nick said it looks like a giant transformer. So these are some of the, the, the craziest stuff that you'll see at this event. And oh yeah, there's some like, you know, major announcements like TVs and processors and things along those lines. So, you know, it truly is a, an impressive show uh, for CES 2023, especially coming back after two years where virtually no one was here. Yeah, I mean, you know, forget the TVs, right? We want the dump truck and the urine testing. That's where the focus is gonna be. Uh, Dan, we are also <laughs> keeping an eye on reports from Bloomberg that Microsoft could be preparing to add OpenAI's chat GPT chatbot to its Bing search engine. What are you hearing about that? Yeah, this is a, a report that uh, has, has come out. Essentially, ChatGPT, people know about it now because uh, you can have it respond to you, uh, your queries, in kind of a natural human way. So uh, you can ask it to write you a poem uh, about Skittles uh, in, you know, I don't know, some kind of temp, uh, iamic temperameter or... I don't know much about poetry. You can write a poem about Skittles, let's just put it that way. <laughs> uh, and it'll do that easily. It's, it's absolutely wild. What this would do is it would give Microsoft, if this is true, and it goes into Bing, a big leg up over Google, specifically because people would be able to search the way they want to using their own language. Uh, and so they don't have to be as exacting and precise in the way they do search. And so that would mean that people would more gradually potentially go to Bing, which is always been kind of a third-rate search engine compared to the likes of Yahoo and Google. And I think that's really, you know, the, the big to-do here is that if they can add that, they would have this big leg up 
over Google. And Google, uh, for what it's worth, is essentially freaking out about this. They want to make sure that they can get this kind of natural language into their own search engine so they're not left in the dust by Bing. Uh, Microsoft has added different types of AI to Bing over time. Uh, it's DALI, uh, OpenAI's DALI has been added to it. So, you know, it's not as though they haven't experimented with stuff like this before, but, you know, Microsoft trying to make this kind of stick and make Bing an even bigger name than Google potentially down the line. Yeah, something they've really struggled with for some time is really just lagging behind Google. We'll see. Uh, Dan Halley with the tech lowdown on the floor of the Consumer Electronics Show for us in Las Vegas. Thanks so much for that. Well, once a darling of many investors' portfolios, Tesla shares have gone from hero to zero over the past year. The combination of industry headwinds, demand concerns, and an unpredictable CEO and Elon Musk have weighed heavily on the EV giant. Some respite in today's session, though. We are seeing that stock up thanks to the continued efforts of Kathy Wood, yes, whose funds bought the dip on the day. The group shares plunged the most since 20. 20, and you see that stock up now about three and a half percent. In October, S&P Global upgraded Tesla to a triple B from a BB plus with a stable outlook of improving production and solid cash flow prospects. So what is the outlook as things stand? And is there space for competitors to steal a march on the industry leader? Joining us for that conversation is Nishit Madlani, S&P Global Senior Director and Automotive Sector Lead. Uh, good to talk to you today. Let me just get your reaction to the sell-off that we have seen in this stock. Yes, it has bounced back, but we're talking about a significant decline from the highs that we saw before. You think it's overdone? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, what I'd say is, look, when we, when we upgraded them to investment grade last quarter, the, the key reasons are really around higher confidence around their, their long-term targets for production, but also the fact that we were expecting pretty strong profit margins and solid cash flow to continue. This is a company that's ended you know, the quarter with 19 and a half billion of cash and almost no debt. And not, not too many companies have, have that level of cash as a proportion of their revenues. So what it does is it, it gives Tesla that much needed dry powder to fund its global expansion in, in an industry that's notoriously volatile, right? So we've seen that with the recent demand concerns, which are adding to all the, all the supply chain and logistical challenges that we think will persist. So we think, we think there's a lot of cushion in the ratings and that's why we have a stable outlook. And Nisha, despite a growth of 40% um, year over year when it came to deliveries, some disappointment though in the fourth quarter with some of the production that failing to roll out at the pace that they would have liked. But when you look at some of the upside and downside risks, what are you honing in on from this point? Yes. So to your point, I think, yes, uh, we, we will say that vehicle sales did come in modestly below our estimates. The first three quarters were better and Q4 was, was somewhat weaker. I, I should add that, look, we're not looking at Tesla's progress in isolation, right? There have been things that could have been worse and we don't want to hold Tesla to different standards if others in the industry are facing similar issues. I will say that for three years, demand has you know far outpaced supply and I don't, I don't think the Q4 data by itself signals a weaker credit story. So yes, there's pressure in China, but but that's that's gonna be existing for almost all automakers operating there. Big picture, I think what we look forward to is, is Tesla's commentary around auto backlogs, just to better understand if demand will in fact outpace supply into 2023. And that's, that's gonna be the focus of their earnings uh, three weeks from now. I mean, so much of the focus around Tesla has long been about its leadership in the EV space. As you know, a lot of competition coming in online, especially this year. You've got this headline today, GM reclaiming the top title as America's top car maker. Obviously, they've got ICE cars as well. But does Tesla's pullback and some of the choppiness that we've seen with that company, does that give an opening to some of these legacy players who have been moving quite aggressively on EVs? That's a great question. And to be honest, that, that's a topic on which we spend a lot of time on the auto side here at S&P Global Ratings. And we, we try to build our credit stories around how different automakers are positioned for the future. The top things we are looking at is, you know, the, the progress that the automakers have made on vertical integration and scale, because we think that is really the, the holy grail for success in EVs. So yes, a lot of them have invested adequately, we think, to maximize in-house production, They've tried to have more control over their supply chain. And to be honest, there's been a lot of investment in battery capacity as well. So I think there has been a lot of, you know, 
multi-billion dollar investment commitments made by automakers in recent years. But it is going to take time for them to bridge the gap as far as you know getting the, the cost efficiency is concerned. Because remember, one thing that, that Tesla has going for itself is the way they've built manufacturing efficiencies. And that's what's led to its you know, stellar margin and cash flow performance. And I think it's going to take some time before the, the traditional automakers get there. And of course, a lot of it depends on market acceptance. And that's that's a big wild card as to you know what's going to be the, the acceptance rate for some of these launches coming up. And we know that when you look at the broader space, Rivian also had issues meeting its production targets. They blamed global supply chain issues. How would you characterize where the EV market is and as Tesla's strongest days of dominance behind them at this point? Yeah, I, I will say, look, the, the industry overall is going to face a lot of challenges, right? We there's, there's immense pressure on Tesla to hold on to this first mover advantage. They, they obviously will need to make the, the total cost of EV ownership more affordable. Uh, and, and their investor day announcements on, on March 1st will probably provide uh, more insights onto this. Uh, there's obviously the need to expand the range of products because like you said, every automaker startups are jumping on the bandwagon in the next three, two to three years. And what's, what's interesting is that number of battery electric vehicles in, in North America is gonna exceed 100 by 2026. That's over four times what we have in, in 2022. So yes, there, there are gonna be winners and losers and over time, it's the ones that build enough capacity and, and have the, the ability, ability to pivot, uh, you know, that's gonna really lead to the, the competitive advantage for the future. Certainly a crowded market indeed. A big thank you there to Nishit Madlani there, S&P Global Ratings Senior Director and Automotive Sector Lead. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, coming up, reports suggest that EU nations could be moving towards joint measures to face a growing COVID crisis in China. This as Beijing threatens retaliation against any such efforts. We'll break down a busy day of news from the world's second biggest economy next. The end of China's tough COVID sanctions are giving investors some optimism for the return of the world's second largest economy. But first, it must overcome the resurgence of COVID infections currently plaguing the country. We're here to discuss the outlook for China's reopening as Albright Stonebridge Group's Vice President, Kyle Sullivan. Kyle, good to see you. So a lot of people wondering about the pace of this reopening now that we're seeing this continued surge in COVID cases, now that zero COVID has been drawn back. Certainly. Yeah. Thanks for uh, having me. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, great question. I think that you know we are likely to see some pretty considerable disruptions in the economy over the next several months as the uh, initial wave of 
infections spreads throughout the country. I think, you know, in particular, China's rural regions are susceptible to rising cases. And we have the Chinese new, uh, Lunar New Year holiday approaching at the end of the month where uh, uh, you know, domestic travel will, will, will increase substantially and potentially uh, certainly keep uh, case rates high through, through, the, uh, through January and probably through February. How does that change the growth trajectory as you see it, though? I mean, there are reports here that suggest that we could see as, mil as many as a million deaths before this latest wave is over. Uh, certainly, I, I, one interesting uh, kind of observation is that it, it seems like case numbers mm -hmm. have have already peaked in, uh, in China's eastern corridor, including Beijing, Tianjin, and other uh, major cities. Uh, that, to me, kind of suggests that perhaps the uh, rate of infections are just a more optimistic kind of scenario than uh, in initially in envisioned or, or perhaps forecasted by, by many analysts. Um, but just in terms of, its, of China's growth outlook, I think you know, um, once the, this initial wave of infection subsides, you know, domestic consumption, which over the past you know, year and a half really has been a major drag on the Chinese economy, and China has a, has a serious demand problem, and that is because of uh, uncertainty about the trajectory of COVID policies. Now that now that co zero COVID has been removed, I think that um, that's a major sigh of relief for many many Chinese consumers, and and consequently, I think we will uh, begin to see domestic consumption, uh, you know, to uh, undergo a kind of pretty substantial recovery, and uh, and con consumer confidence should should improve again once this initial wave of infection subsides. So, Kyle, obviously, we're still going to wait to see what happens after the Lunar New Year holiday. But in terms of mm -hmm. the sectors that are going to benefit initially from the zero COVID loosening versus the longer term, the ones mm -hmm. that will be slower to recover, which one do you identify? So, uh, great question. I think the sectors that really have uh, suffered the most under zero COVID uh, will will uh, experience a, 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 a rebound in the near term, and that includes more consumer service oriented sectors like travel, hospitality, uh, you know, brick and mortar retail, catering and, di and dining. Um, so I, I certainly see some uh, room for growth in, in those sectors uh, in, in the coming months. Um, other sectors that perhaps uh, will benefit, I mean, I mean the, the big, big, big question is about the property sector, right? Um, I, I think that the property sector, which is, you know, it comprises about a quarter, you know, a quarter to one third of China's GDP, just depending on, on how you look at it. Um, I think that there's room for growth there. Under zero COVID, you know, prospective home buyers had delayed purchases and home prices fell, right, due to subdued demand. Certainly there were uh, sectoral policies, such as the three red lines, um, which had basically dried up liquidity among property developers that had spooked home buyers as well. But the government has, I uh, just saw a report uh, earlier this morning that uh, uh, private equity investors are now able to uh, restart uh, financing rounds for for uh, property developments, and so there's 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 momentum, there's policy momentum behind this effort to revive the property sector. And I think yeah. in an optimistic scenario, once this in initial wave of infections passes, home buyers could begin to begin searching for for mm -hmm. uh, you know, competitively priced flats. I think particularly in kind of tertiary so cities. Kyle, obviously the property sector, a big question mark within the Chinese economy, but there's two other overhangs we've been watching really closely. It's the regulatory pushback against the tech firms in China from domestic regulators. And then you've got the accounting concerns that have played out over in the U.S. for Chinese listed companies. We got the report today that Ant Financial or Ant Group, I should say, which is the fintech arm of Jack, Jack Ma's um, company, they have now gotten approval from regulators to, to raise additional funds, which is a plus. And then you had what happened with the PCAOB several weeks ago that suggested that, yes, in fact, U.S. accounting firms will get full access, at least into these companies initially. How big of a risk does that eliminate from Chinese investments or at least investments into Chinese companies? Certainly, I think we've seen a return to pragmatism among Chinese officials um, and with, as evidenced by some of the, the uh, 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 data points that you mentioned there. 
Um, but I, I think that you know the, this regulatory rectification campaign that began in mid 2021 uh, is it's it's there will be remnants of the of this recurring throughout the future, right? It's not just a one off uh, crackdown on on tech sectors. I think that most domestic Chinese technology companies, uh, internet platforms, have certainly received the message from Beijing that that certain types of, of commercial behavior will not be tolerated. And they have s subsequently adjusted to, to those regulations. And so um, I think that the risk of a, of a further crackdown, it, it still exists, it, particularly in, uh, fi in the financial technology sector. That is one to look, look out for. Uh, <clears throat> FinTech has been in Beijing sites well before the the crackdown, if you look at 2016-2017 uh, period, um, the the crackdown against P2P lending, right? Uh, that was yeah. a huge, huge thing. And so that's that's that that sector in particular, I think, will always, uh, you know, just will, will certainly receive regulatory pressure going forward. Yeah, it appears there's some optimism, at least for one day, as we look at those Chinese ADRs rallying today on the back of that news mm. on Ant Group. Um, Kyle, it's good to talk to you today. Albright Stone Group, Stonebridge Group VP Kyle Sullivan, appreciate your time. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, coming up, courtroom drama from the overturning of Roe versus Wade to Elon Musk and Elizabeth Holmes. It was a busy year for legal affairs. We're going to look ahead to what the coming 12 months could bring. That's coming up next. Something old and something new. The financial world might be shuffling back to work to start off the new year, but what about all the courtroom dramas? What about the law? They're also seeing some familiar names and of course some brand new challenges. Let's take a look at some of the biggest legal issues, cases and trials that we're watching in 2023 with Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan. Well, businesses might still be getting back to work in this new year, but courts are back in session. These are the big stories in business law to watch in 2023. A 24-year-old law that keeps everything from YouTube to shoe shops from getting sued over what their users post on their online platforms is headed to the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, the EU will start enforcing new laws that open the door to liability for user-generated content. The new laws, the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act also say big tech companies must not favor their own products and services over third parties. 
Student debt in focus as well. In two cases coming up this year, the Supreme Court will consider whether President Biden has the power to cancel student loan debt for certain American taxpayers. In 2022, the president issued an executive order to forgive up to $20,000 in educational debt for some taxpayers in certain adjusted income brackets. And the Theranos saga continues. Fallen Silicon Valley entrepreneur Elizabeth Holmes says she's appealing her criminal fraud convictions that were reached by a federal jury. Holmes, who founded the blood testing startup Theranos, was sentenced for lying to investors who backed her company, defrauding them of hundreds of millions of dollars. At its peak, Theranos was valued at $9 billion and had made Holmes the world's wealthiest self-made woman. And Elon Musk, meanwhile, under a microscope over his take private acquisition of Twitter in October. The issue at stake? Whether Twitter, with its dramatically reduced staff, can still comply with a long-standing agreement with the FTC. That's to protect private user data. The serial CEO, of course, still running Tesla, SpaceX, and Neuralink, all of which are also drawing scrutiny from market watchers. And staying with tech, an appeals court set this year to decide if Apple violated antitrust laws when it blocked video game developer Epic Games from its app store. In September, following a federal trial in California, a district court judge issued an injunction to stop Apple from blocking direct in-app purchases and from blocking developers from communicating directly with their customers. And finally, the FTX fallout, the $32 billion implosion that sent the second largest crypto empire, FTX, into bankruptcy is now also a criminal matter. After the U.S. Justice Department filed fraud charges against the company's founder and CEO, Sam Bankman-Fried, Fried is also facing civil actions from the SEC and CFTC. The former crypto chief was arrested in the Bahamas last month. The bankruptcy, along with the charges brought by U.S. authorities, promised to be among the most closely watched business law stories of 2023. Well, coming up, debt debacles. A new year brings the same old questions on student debt. As the fate of Fred President Biden's forgiveness plan rests with the Supreme Court, we asked one entrepreneur what you could do to safeguard your future. That's coming up next.
Well, as young adults enter college, they are faced with unexpected payments for books or housing, but it's the long-term loans that are leaving the lasting impacts. The total owed sits about above $1.77 trillion. That is more than tripled over the past 15 years. Now with the pandemic pause on payments set to resume and no decision in sight for the Supreme Court's call on President Biden's forgiveness program, borrowers are somewhat left in the dark as we begin 2023. For more on this, we now welcome in Amira Yayawi, the founder of Moss. Uh, this segment brought to you by Synchrony Bank Savings. Uh, good to talk to you today. Let's sort of set the stage here for those um, who haven't necessarily been following this story, because effectively student payments or student loan payments for at least federal loans have been paused since March of 2020. We're talking about going on three years now. I mean, how significant a burden is it going to place on those if in fact that pause is lifted sometime later this year? So first of all, uh, thank you for having me. Um, the student loan uh, repayment and all these pauses and all these help that is given by uh, the Biden administration is helpful for the past. For people who are looking at the future for the students who are going to college right now, there is no student loan pause or help or anything. They will need to figure out how to pay for college and they will need to be uh, figuring out also like how to pay those loans in the future. So in, in creating your business, in creating Moss, talk about some of the barriers that your app is trying to overcome that still exist right now. Yes. So how we think about Moss is a solution for the future, not um, like a band-aid for the past. The problem is education should be affordable and should be accessible to people. And the price of education today is absolutely impossible for most Americans and most college students. So instead of us trying to figure out a hack to loans, what Moss does, we help them get all the free money to go for college. And that by being today the biggest scholarship pool in America, we have over $160 billion yearly of financial aid that student can get directly by using the app. The way we do it is every student uh, who uses our platform is paired with a, a personal financial aid advisor who has them navigate the complex process of paying for college and ensure that they get the lowest uh, amount possible, potentially even waiving their full tuition. What's the cost? I mean, how do you, how does your app make money? Yes. So people, uh, students pay Moss $150 a year to get the full suite of services. That's how we make money. So then in terms of the gap that this fills, obviously, we still don't know what's going to happen with student loan forgiveness. If, say, President Biden does end up having this be successful, what, what does that mean for companies like yours? Wait, excuse me, can you repeat that again? Sure. If President Biden is successful with the student loan forgiveness, in terms of the need for companies like yours, does it make it more difficult or does it make it easier for you to, to have your business grow? What do you mean by being successful? Do you mean that, that President Biden would wipe $1.7 trillion of student debt? Does that mean that President Biden will give $1.7 trillion in the past and give again $1.7 trillion in the future? Or does President Biden make all college education in America free? Because today, the only solution is to make all college uh, education in America free. That's what will make us not exist. So, so basically, you're saying unless all student debt is wiped out, your, your company yes. will be just fine. You'll be able to grow. Unfortunately, gotcha. yes. Right. I mean, we, we, help, we help students so on average get $3,500 of money, free money every year. Uh, most of our students get around $16,000, which usually be a huge wipe uh, down of loans that they take. Again, Moss doesn't help anyone with loans. We get them all the free money they're eligible for. And that money comes from the taxes that their parents paid for. Those are their rights. Well, certainly we know that it, it does differ in different countries in terms of how education is viewed. Obviously, it's, it's much more expensive over here. Amira Yayawi, thank you so much. The founder of Moss, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. All right, coming up, escape from New York. Manhattan home prices are plummeting. We'll tell you why next.
Manhattan home prices dipped by over 5% in the fourth quarter, its biggest year-over-year decline since mid-2020. That's according to Miller Samuel Inc. and Douglas Element Real Estate. Now, apartment sales also fell by 29% in the quarter, stoking fears of a frozen market as economic headwinds weigh on both buyers and sellers. And, you know, Akika, we've talked about, you know, that what's been happening with the real estate market when you are in a rate rising environment, what's happening with interest rates. So at least a little bit of relief. But being that it's Manhattan, one of the highest priced areas in the country, that 5.5 percent is probably that's a lot for people. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a similar narrative we're seeing across the country when you think about where mortgage rates are right now. Uh, just above 7% for a 30-year fix. That makes it a lot more expensive to buy. And then there's, of course, the inventory picture, too. And that's no different over in Manhattan. I should point out, we're looking at a comparison from 2020. Yes, it's down from then. But when you compare it to pre-pandemic levels, this is according to the data that was released by Miller Samuel and Douglas Elliman, we're still stronger than before the pandemic. Price is now still 10% above what was $999,000. That was the medium price here. And then closing total nearly 6% above where it was three years ago. So not all is lost. Yes, the comparisons here are to where things were during the pandemic. We did see a huge boom, not just in Manhattan, but across the country because the rates were so low. And especially for first time home buyers, people looking to perhaps start renting, even what we've seen with rental prices, still pretty exorbitant compared to where we were pre pandemic. Because as we mentioned, inventory is still too tight for a lot of these people to transition from renting into ownership. And we know that a lot of the places that benefited during the pandemic, your Texas, your, your, your Southeast Belt, your Floridas, they're seeing just something of a pullback. A lot of people relocated thinking, look, maybe remote work is here to stay. But as we continue to see those dynamics change, and perhaps at some point as we see the, the Fed perhaps take a pause, perhaps people might be a bit more encouraged to get into the field. I know that I've seen a lot more houses coming back on the market when I look in D.C. and Maryland and Virginia, seeing a lot more houses come back on the market that had taken off because a lot of people had just stopped looking. But now we're seeing a lot more interest coming back into the market. Yeah, but if you're a seller, right, you're probably looking at some of the more discounted prices saying, well, maybe this isn't a good time to get in. Maybe I wait a little longer or maybe I put it up for a lease instead of actually selling it because you can actually make more money with that. So obviously that's not a Manhattan specific story. We should point out, by the way, luxury market, one we focus on a lot of Manhattan, that median price was just over 5.8 million dollars. That's an increase of 4.2 percent from a year earlier. So the luxury market still very strong there. Uh, let's do a final check of the markets before we let you go. We were sort of looking at a rebound from where we were the last. Uh, so yesterday was uh, hard to forget already. It's just the first trading day of the year. But we are seeing the Dow now up 265 points, the S&P 500 up 47 and the Nasdaq up 123 points. That does it for Rochelle and I in the 11 a.m. Eastern hour. We're going to be right back here with with you tomorrow. Thanks so much for watching.